Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Bienvenue à la Comité des Finances et de Développement Économique. Uh, welcome to the Finance and Economic Development Committee for the 5th of June, 2018. Uh, declarations of interest. Confirmation of minutes, minutes 37, the 1er May 2018, the 1st of May 2018. Carried. Uh, communications as presented. Uh, presentations, Councillor El Shantiri has uh, a motion. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, uh, we have uh, three uh, presentations, the Confederation Line, Refugee Resettlement, and the Ottawa 2017. Therefore, be it resolved that the Finance and Economic Development Committee waive the rules of procedure to receive the presentations listed in, uh, as item 1, 2, and 3 on today's FATCO agenda and pursuant to subsection, to subsection 83 4, dispense with the requirement for staff to provide a separate written report on these presentations. So, on the motion, carried. Uh, so we'll, we'll just go through the consent agenda. So we have uh, the three presentations. Item number four, um, we'll hold it because it deals with the presentation for Ottawa 2017, so we'll come back to that. Office of the City Clerk and Solicitor, Bureau de Scrafier Municipal de l'Avocat General, Amendment to the Composition of the Glebe Business Improvement Area Board of Management, Modification of the Composition du Conseil d'Administration de la Zone d'Amélioration Commerciale du Glebe. Okay. Right. Item 6, Status Update, Finance and Economic Development Committee Inquiries and Motions for the period ending May 25th, Rapport de Situation uh, jusqu'à le 25 May 2018. Received. Uh, Corporate Services Department, direct, Direction Générale des Services, uh, Delegation of Authority, Acquisition and Sale of Land and Property, January 1st, 2018 to March 31st, 2018, Delegation de Pouvoir, Acquisition et Vente de Terrain, uh, the 1er janvier 2018 or 21 mars 2018. Uh, item 8, uh, capital budget adjustment and closing of projects, city tax and rate, uh, city tax and rate support it. We'll hold on that and we have a motion. Uh, why don't we just move your motion now, Councillor, to get that out of the way. This is to put it, uh, there was a, a, a slight uh, change in column 3, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry, so it's, it's to add this report to the agenda, so Councillor, if you'd like to move that, please. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, therefore we resolve that Finance and Economic Development Committee approve the addition of this item to consider the report titled Capital Budget Adjustment and Closing of Project City Tax and Rate Supported. Listed as item 8 on today's agenda pursuant to subsection 89 of the procedures by law. Agreed. Carried. Okay, yeah. so we'll come back to that. Item 9, financing lease arrangements 2017, Convention de Crédit, by 2017. Carried. Okay. Um, item 10, 2017 investments, endowment fund, and other treasury activity report. Some good news in this. We congratulate you. Is it a quick question, Councillor? Sorry? Okay. All right. Uh, Planning, Infrastructure and Economic Development Department, Direction General de Planification de l'Infrastructure et Développement Economique, uh, Implementation Plan for the Ottawa Public Library and Archives Canada Joint Facility. Carrie? Yeah. yeah. No, hold. Oh, another hold. What's that? She said hold. Okay, so we'll come back to that. And uh, Brownfields Grant Program, we have delegations and a presentation, so we'll come back to that. Okay, so uh, we have uh, our uh, monthly presentation on Confederation Line. Uh, Mr. Manconi is here with his staff to bring us up to date. And following that is Councillor Kakish uh, doing a refugee reach settlement update, and then the Ottawa 2017 final update, and then we'll go to the uh, Brownfield project. Uh, there is space uh, in the caucus room just uh, out through that door. The sound is piped in through there if people would like to take a seat. Uh, 
and there's some seats over here as well if, you, if you'd like. So I think we have uh, PowerPoint. Might be shining on you, Tim. <laughs> do we have the second screen? Matt's going to do that. Okay. So, Councillor Deans, on the uh, what item was that, Councillor? Ten. Uh, no longer has a question. So, on the uh, the investment, which is uh, great news, I'm just going to thank the treasurer for our wise uh, investment policy. Carried. Okay. So here we go, Mr. Mancone. Uh, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Bonjour à tous. Uh, happy to be before you, giving you your monthly update. Uh, this represents uh, the work to date uh, that we've been doing with RTG. Uh, I want to start off with um, uh, a focus on train testing. Um, you've uh, obviously seen a lot of activity on the eastern corridor. That's where the, uh, the majority of the movements are. All the movements are occurring. And what you're seeing now are multiple trains, as this is uh, next to Herdman Station. So those uh, trains are going through uh, vigorous testing. Uh, the other thing that you're seeing, uh, you may have seen, is uh, we've coupled uh, two vehicles together. This is how the train is going to be operating in service. This is how you get your capacity. It's uh, 600 passengers and almost a, a football field in length. And uh, I have for you a short video that uh, demonstrates the length of the vehicle. Also, you'll see the numerous numbers of doors as, um, as we go through the video. Just give me a second here. Do you want to get that one? And I'm going to get my technician down because he knows how to do this video. Just give me a second, please. And we don't have the uh, French... This is quiet as the trains are. Bring it down and get there. So over time, uh, you're going to see more and more of those double trains on the track uh, being tested as part of the uh, testing commission phase. With respect to the vehicles, I'm happy to report that the uh, final vehicle for Stage 1 is, uh, is underway. This picture is about a week old or so. Uh, so that's the cab on the right and then the, uh, the main body of the vehicle being assembled. Uh, that completes the uh, full assembly of the entire fleet for Stage 1. Now I'm going to take you on a, uh, our tour from east to west, and the strategy that RTG is using uh, is they're completing stations starting at the far end at Blair and working uh, towards the core. Uh, and like a house in its final stages, you're seeing all the fit and finish work uh, occurring, important elements. And if you go back to five years ago, four and a half years ago, now we got our CTV folks giving me feedback. Um, when you go back uh, five years ago, uh, you saw pictures of all those important amenities that you endorse as part of this build. And while we're building a rail system, we're really building a fully integrated system with MUPS, with cycling facilities, with great connectivity throughout your community, with artwork and all those amenities. And incrementally, you're going to see more and more of that as part of the finish. So this is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, some of these cycling uh, facilities. There's going to be trees planted in there. And when you go inside a Blair station, you see the finished ceiling work that's being completed. And then also you get into some of the key uh, safety and security elements. This is a, a roll-down gate that closes uh, when the station's not in service, after hours and so forth. And then if you look to the ceiling tiles, you see cameras, uh, and there's a final pane of glass that's going to go in on, in on the left-hand side there. 
again some finished products within the servo station you really start to get a sense of how uh, open these stations are once you peel away all the protective uh, plywood that was on those stairs and, and so forth um, and um, the uh, glass on both sides and on the ceilings of that platform that provides uh, weather protection. Trombley station, uh, final uh, glazing going in on some of those lengthy panels. Uh, the ceilings are almost complete and then the station's uh, elevators are uh, fully enclosed with glass and there's the decorative shrouds on the top. Saint Laurent, uh, nearing completion, uh, porcelain tiles on the right hand side, that is that nice finish compared to uh, if you were to go to some of the uh, lower cost tunnel finishes where you just have concrete, uh, you have uh, that great material on the right hand side, you have the next train's a stop announcement overhead, cameras, speakers and uh, those panels where all the conduits are hidden will have the wayfinding sign for the direction and the stations. Happy to report that uh, Fairgate installations have uh, moved in. This again is part of that final fit and finish. So you see the lighting levels, you see the porcelain tiles on the right, cameras, and then the, uh, the Fairgates. That took about not even two days to install those because every single station has all the bases and pre-installed the conduit and uh, all of the electrical mechanical feeds required for that to accept those uh, Fairgates. So they're working in the western corridor. Saint Laurent is uh, complete. They're moving, I believe, next to Servo and then Blair. Along with those fare gates uh, are your integrated uh, fare vending equipment. A reminder, these are uh, probably one of the best in North America in that that screen, anytime you have any question relating to anything on OC Transpo, you push that button and a live agent uh, will greet you and can answer any question from fare to where you should be heading or what train to take, what bus to take, uh, and any question. You can buy a Presto card there, you can load up, you can buy a day pass, multiple passes, uh, every single type of fare medium that you need, and then also answer your questions. You can top up your fare card and so forth. Uh, Herdman Station is uh, receiving a lot of the final glazing. You see the uh, elevators enclosed and the top of the uh, elevators with the decorative feature and uh, also the uh, partitions on the exterior side. And then if you look at the concrete uh, structure, that is getting wrapped in that final uh, silver uh, metal uh, finish. With the fare gates um, come this iconic uh, wayfinding uh, sign, which you will see probably next month a lot of the finishing work getting done. It is your, your O, which is symbolic. It's a, a, every single station will have this. And um, that is a white porcelain backlit with LED lighting. And where, uh, where that uh, piece of white porcelain is absent, there's going to be a big O, a red O, which you will see lit up at nighttime hours and obviously during the day. And then those two uh, black pods are where the uh, fare vending equipment goes in. Uh, so it's important for uh, wayfinding, but also very strategically thought out that when you go into a station, you look to the right, and there's always fair equipment, uh, fair uh, vending machines if you need a fare. All of that's been mapped out from a customer journey uh, perspective and been tested in the market. Uh, this is Lee's station, and the reason I show you that is that right steel framing, that's what houses that big O, uh, the, the uh, backlighting, and then those two pods that you see there is the equipment, uh, for, uh, slots for the fair vending equipment. University of Ottawa station, there's uh, landscaping going on. You've seen we close that bus lane periodically. That's to get the final glazing on the outside of that station. They're doing interlock there. You'll see railings and final uh, finish work uh, being done in the next couple of days. <clears throat> Excuse me. Rideau Station. This is the station that has the, uh, the most significant amount of work. It looks very uh, packed. Uh, that's a strategic move by RTG. They have loaded that station up before they close the tunnel with equipment uh, and material. So if you were to go into that station, it's a very crowded and busy spot. That's by design. Uh, they have advised us they are working 24-7 uh, in that tunnel. Uh, in that uh, portion of the uh, station and the tunnel and uh, also they're going uh, they're double shifting in some of the other locations so I know one of the questions has been you know why is it after four o'clock you don't see activity at some of the above ground stations I can tell you that Rio station is 24 7 and some of the other locations they're, they're double shifting to make sure that they get all the civil work done 
some uh, extra shots of Rideau Station on the right-hand side. That will encase some art uh, for a future date. Parliament Station, uh, what's going on here is the final landscaping, and uh, that station will be closed up very shortly with glazing and doors. And then also a reminder that a lot of our partners are doing uh, great work to their buildings. So this is the Mogard building. They're, they're fixing up their entrance, and other uh, locations will be integrated into their buildings. Uh, they're leveraging LRT, so this is driving investment and, and also uh, great-looking facilities and facades uh, like the Rideau Center. Uh, underneath Parliament Station, uh, so again a lot of finishing work, uh, the steel railing you see in the middle, uh, that's both semi-decorative but also uh, it's a security measure so that people don't traverse those, cra uh, those uh, tracks uh, anytime. Lion Station, um, that I'm showing you a vent shaft, not that it's very attractive but it's a, it's a critical piece of infrastructure and People were wondering why it was taking so much time in this corridor. Those are critical elements for uh, exhaust of the tunnel. You see those in Montreal, New York City, and uh, other places where they have underground infrastructure. And what's going on here is the final landscaping around uh, the vent shaft. Uh, Lion Station, in terms of finishing work, about 85% of the porcelain tile is down, which you see on the floor. And then uh, those columns, again, some great architectural features. Those gaps that you see there will be LED lighting. The ceiling, uh, you could imagine how boring that ceiling would be if it was just straight. The architect has, sh has uh, configured it so it, it undulates, and it's, uh, it's going to be very attractive once the final uh, finishings are on there shortly. Pimacy Station, um, uh, that's progressing well. The elevators are almost complete and they're doing glazing work uh, throughout that station, uh, both on railings and the elevators and the exterior walls. This is another shot of Pimacy Station, the platform. So you saw Blair and Cerevo, how complete those are. This is getting the final conduit uh, fed through. And again, it's an integrated architectural design, so everything is hidden. You will not see conduit, loose wires throughout the station. It's a very clean finish that will uh, uh, last uh, the test of time. The overhead uh, hanging brackets, that's lighting, security, signage, speakers, and then there's glazing that goes over top so that our customers are uh, weather protected. Bayview Station, this picture is about a week old or so. I can tell you those tarps are off. The elevators are almost completed in terms of glazing, and the rooftops are about to receive the shrouds that cover those, uh, those big boxes on the top. Bayview, this is an interesting shot in that your Trillium line, if you look to the back, that is the uh, Trillium line train. Uh, this is an extension of that track that brings it right into the Bayview station, so it's fully integrated. So those customers will get off the Trillium uh, train and they're inside the Bayview station. And then what happens here is everything gets integrated. So the MUPS get completed, the station platform gets completed, and uh, soon that train will be pulling into that station, and you'll have a multimodal connection from the diesel line to the electrified rail, and a reminder that the developers to the left of that are building a bridge connected right into that system so that they have a Trinity development, so they have a fully integrated station into LRT. So again, it's not just a mobility project, it's also leveraging a lot of your overarching council policies on development and an uplift that you wanted. Tunney's Pasture, uh, lots of work being done here on electrical and mechanical. Uh, things you don't see, they're behind the scenes. Off to the right, there's a bunch of electrical rooms and control rooms uh, that they're working on. And they're getting ready to do the final glazing, both on the upper concourse and through the customer waiting areas. Public art, um, can't say enough about this. You're starting to see it pop up throughout the stations. Uh, I know the mayor tweeted out uh, Pimacy, the, uh, the eel was uh, installed last week. It's a beautiful piece of artwork. Uh, Servo Station has the trees. Blair Station has the art hanging on the side of the walls. Uh, so you're starting to see that throughout your network. The maintenance and storage facility, we've had some questions about what's the construction activity at the maintenance and storage uh, facility and you know a lot of people have asked, well, does the delay in stage one have any impact on stage two? Absolutely not. You've awarded stage two vehicle construction and you've also awarded stage two uh, expansion of the storage and uh, maintenance facility. That is where you're going to be building your vehicles. So all that activity that you're seeing there is for stage two. In addition to that, 
That's where they assemble the vehicles, they do testing and commissioning, and they also uh, maintain the, the fleet, which is in test mode right now. Once that uh, uh, construction is completed um, and we move into revenue service, that's where all the cleaning, the inspection, the maintenance, and the storage of all the 34 vehicles for Stage 1 is done, and a portion of Stage 2 also. It's the headquarters for the administration related to the O-Train Confederation line, and it's the assemble for, assembly for Stage 2. You own that building. That is your asset, just like the rail corridor. We have a 30-year maintenance uh, uh, program associated with that and the vehicles. In the last meeting, Mr. Mayor, uh, Chair Blay asked for uh, some uh, look ahead in terms of winter operations, so we've prepared a few slides. We've met with the new general manager of RTM, Rideau Transit Maintenance Group, and just a reminder, once Rideau Transit Group is completed their construction, it moves through a 30-year uh, maintenance uh, contract with RTM. Uh, he's a seasoned professional. He's got lots of rail experience. Um, and with respect to the question about uh, winter operations, there's been a number of extensive weather preparedness meetings with OC Transville for about three years. Um, there's going to be ongoing communication throughout all events like we do with uh, our other modes of uh, transit. Uh, they are leveraging the great weather resources that we have in public works so that they can do forecast-based mitigation. Uh, and they will do things like other properties do where we'll operate trains during heavy storms throughout the evening hours to make sure that snow buildup and ice buildup is minimized. And then a reminder that we have an integrated control center so we see every train, we see every system uh, live in our control center as does RTM. There, uh, you may see in the coming months some testing of some vehicles out on the track. Uh, they have bought brand new equipment for the winter maintenance. Uh, everything from overhead catenary equipment uh, to uh, snowblower sweeping uh, vehicles that you see here. And there is a weather um, um, uh, assessment plan that was done on wind and snow throughout the corridor so they know if there's any hot spots where to spend extra time and resources. There's also uh, our large, large network of cameras which we will use for operations and maintenance during weather events leading up to them and, and, and also uh, as we phase out of them. There are uh, snow melting cables and tracing cables in key locations along the platforms and stairways to keep it clear of ice and snow so our platforms are heated. Uh, and then uh, this question comes up, what about the escalators and the elevators? There will be regular escalator uh, and elevator cleaning and proactive maintenance, particularly in the winter months where tracking of uh, salt and, and uh, small pea stone accumulation is problematic. So in closing, Mr. Mayor, the things we're, at, we're monitoring with RTG, we're having, uh, we continue to have very good dialogue with, uh, with them. Their new uh, director, who is well in place right now, uh, continues to focus on achieving November 2nd. Um, the uh, Rideau station is an area that both they and we are monitoring very aggressively. Uh, those two western stations, Tunnies and Bayview, we're keeping a close eye on those. Um, the, I can't say enough about the end-to-end -end system verification that I've talked to you about in the past, everything from fire alarms to cameras to passenger systems. The fare gates and the tick and vending machines are underway now. I was pleased to see that that started. And uh, our strategy of testing them out on the trillion line and then rolling them out in Confederation line seems to have worked very, very well, so we'll continue to monitor that. The computer-based train uh, control system that I walked you through last meeting is the thing that we're keeping our eye on very, very closely. They have to get to a maturity level that minimizes the number of issues and things that they need to deal with. So that is being focused on the eastern alignment. So those pictures of those trains in the video was all out in the east. Um, and then they have to move to the western alignment and through the tunnel. Uh, we will uh, need to see the end-to-end -end testing that I've talked about before from Blair to Tunney's and then full operation of all trains in CBTC mode. And we continue to work with RTG to see that they're adhering to the November 2nd RSA date. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. That concludes the presentation. Great. Thank you. That was uh, very thorough. Good to see the progress on the stations. Uh, just uh, one question. Uh, the seniors... Uh, who get free transit on uh, Wednesdays, uh, how will they go through the uh, Fairgate system? They don't have a pass now, do they? It's just the person tells the driver they're over 65. 
that's all coded as part of the system and their cards and then there's also the workaround if they're stuck they press that button the uh, attendant can see them and if they don't have a card we, we will let them through the fair gate so there's a structured process and there's also a workaround okay thank you uh, questions uh, Councillor Deans well, thank you for the presentation I must say uh, um, your monthly attendance here is really painting, I think, a graphic picture for us of how the magnitude of this project. Like, it's huge, and there's so much going on. But I must say, if I was taking possession of a home and it was in the state of readiness, I'd be really worried about my November 2nd closing date. So I'm just wondering um, where your confidence level is. I think I've been asking you this every month, but in, both in terms of the construction side and the systems integration side. So with, with every month and every week or day that goes by, and what I look for is incremental movement in the right direction, um, we are seeing that. The, uh, the new director that uh, has been put in place, I will give RTG a lot of credit. Uh, the shift that they did is they really moved, and you can tell by the pictures, from construction, heavy civil, to system testing and commissioning. Uh, uh, Rupert, that's his name, he has a lot of experience in this regard. He's commissioned lines before. He has brought resources to the table that have done testing and commissioning. Uh, he made it very, very clear when he met with Mr. Cripps and I the first week that he has one mandate, and that is to get to November 2nd. And I can assure you that I made it crystal clear to him that I don't like surprises, that if they have any concerns about not getting to November 2nd, myself and Mr. Kanalakis need to know. And to date, their position continues to be they're achieving November 2nd. But I will not wait for October to tell you we're not making November 2nd, if that's the case. Uh, the oversight, the resources, the support that we've had from the integrated city team is unrelenting and uh, uh, to date RTG continues to say that they're going to achieve November 2nd. I can tell you, your strategy and the P3 that you awarded is working because November, uh, May 25th has come and gone and now they are uh, being funded by their parent companies and they need to get to November 2nd. And I know some people will say, well, they'll compromise on quality. They won't because they have a 30-year concession that they make very significant profit margins. So if they give us a clunky system, they'll pay for it during the 30 years, and they won't do that. And so the, the systems, that's why I'm taking the time to show you the quality mm -hmm. and the effort they're putting into that. There's, there's a lot of skin in the game for them during the build, and there's a lot of skin in the game for them during the 30-year concession period. And so they need to bring us, and we've been very, very clear on all those parameters. You're going to give us the system we, we paid for at the service level, the 11,000 people per hour per direction on opening day, and it has to be reliable and uh, continuously reliable throughout that period. You talked about uh, systems integration last month and uh, having more concern about all of those systems talking to each other than the construction side. Um, so is that still your concern that uh, systems integration could be the Achilles heel? System integration is the thing to watch. And uh, again, that short video that I showed you about, that's another incremental step in that direction. So you have coupled vehicles together. That looks very easy in the picture, but those two trains need to talk to each other. So that's what they're testing out there. Uh, the train that's parked out at Tunney's Pasture that I know we've had some people tweeting, why is there a train sitting out there and a security guard? It's because that train is talking to the system at the uh, control center in Tunney's, uh, one of those units in there. Um, so we're starting to see a lot of good progress in that regard. Um, they, as you get through various levels of maturity of the system testing, there's level one, two, three, and four. Once you, as you incrementally go through those levels of maturity, the number of issues are exponentially less. So when you go from one, while you have X number of issues, you go to two, it's not cut by half, it's actually exponentially less, sometimes three, four times less issues. And Rupert and his team are moving through that systematically with the right resources. Talus is at the table. They've brought more resources to it. That's the, uh, the uh, folks that have built the CBTC system. And uh, so we're, we're seeing all the right indicators. As I said last month, I, can I guarantee you absolutely? I, you don't want someone sitting in this chair saying they're going to guarantee you uh, that. Just wanna, uh, so. We're just trying to get a sense. Um, what level are we at currently? 
Well, the major update this month is you have multiple trains out in the corridor. You have uh, a coupled train out in the corridor, and the systems are talking to and each other. And you said there's level one, two, three, and four. Are we in level one? He's, he's producing a report for Mr. Cripps and I. We will know better next month where we are. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, Council Colsey Manette. Just a quick question on the cycling facilities. I noticed that uh, there is uh, quite a bit of cycling facilities. Will, uh, will there be security or security cameras so that people feel safe that when they do put their bikes there all day sort of thing, that uh, you know, when they come back, the bikes will still be there? Yes, we have thousands of cameras on out there. Okay, thank you. Well, listen, uh, thank you very much. It's great to see the progress each meeting that is um, coming with this project. And I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Mancone and Mr. Cripps, uh, because uh, you've certainly been keeping the pressure on our partners, and uh, I think that's uh, needed to ensure that uh, we meet uh, our public's expectation. You know, there's a lot of people I see almost every day on Twitter, uh, people filming the, uh, the trains coming. There's a real sense of excitement that they're, they're moving, and, um, uh, you know, we obviously are uh, as, a, as a community looking forward to the, the date of November 2nd and making sure that we meet that date. So we appreciate all of your good work and thank you for the presentation. Uh, next is the refugee resettlement update. I asked Councillor Kakish to uh, uh, bring forward a report on the work that we have done with the Syrian refugees and I want to thank him publicly for uh, his efforts. He's been to many different community gatherings and um, meetings with everyone from Refugee 613 to Catholic Immigration Center uh, and other uh, not-for-profit and community groups. So I think we have a PowerPoint, so we'll ask him to get ready for that, and then we'll be followed by Ottawa 2017. Final, final update, I see uh, the recently retired Guy Laflamme, who is uh, with us, and we thank him and his team. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, and good morning uh, to colleagues and uh, everyone here. I'm pleased to provide an uh, update on the uh, refugee resettlement uh, efforts. Uh, as many of you know, in the fall of 2015, uh, Mayor committed the City of Ottawa as a facilitator uh, of the Community Syrian Refugee Resettlement and appointed uh, me as a special liaison for refugees. This decision was in line with our strategic priority of supporting the community's efforts to integrate uh, refugees in the city's municipal immigration strategy for 2016-2018 approved by council in April 2016. This was also a very important decision because research indicates that more support received by refugees in the first years of arrival, the more successful their integration is over time. And the early indicators are confirming this correlation. As a city special liaison for refugees, I've been asked to provide a summary of the collective uh, efforts on resettlement in Ottawa. I'm extremely proud of the work we have accomplished as a city on this important endeavor. And in my role as special liaison for refugees, I was uh, able to meet uh, with uh, newcomers uh, from Syria and speak to them in their language and work closely with our various settlement uh, agencies across the city. And in fact, just on the weekend, I was in uh, Emmanuel United Church in Alta Vista, where uh, a group of um, local uh, residents in Riverside South uh, did a group of five to sponsor Hani Dima and their 15-month-old uh, baby Paul as well. And so it's been uh, very, um, very rewarding and very uh, gratifying to see so many of uh, our residents come together because we know without uh, the community and residents of the city we wouldn't have been able to uh, integrate the number of Syrian newcomers over the short period of time that we've seen. Ottawa, in terms of context, Ottawa has a long history of welcoming immigrants and refugees, and I appreciate and applaud how welcoming our community has been. The Syrian refugee resettlement effort across Canada began in late fall of 2015, and Ottawa has a strong pre-existing network of settlement and community agencies uh, who provide services to all newcomers and immigrants, including additional programs or supports. Uh, tailored specifically to Syrian or other refugee populations. The city's efforts leverage this capacity and expertise. 
Arrivals uh, in Ottawa, this slide shows some of the arrival data for our city. I would like to speak to a couple of components here uh, which are highlighted. Then you'll see the major difference between the two charts. Uh, one speaks specifically to Syrian refugees and one speaks to refugees in general. And you see the numbers between November of 2015 and February 2018, Ottawa welcomed 2,740 uh, Syrian refugees, which constitu constitutes uh, approximately 617 households, and 63% uh, of who came as government-assisted uh, refugees, known as GARS. So 4,685 uh, resettled refugees from all countries of origin arrived in Ottawa between January uh, 2015 and February 2018. So recognizing that the reporting is slightly different time frames, you'll still note that about half of the refugees arriving are from Syria. Uh, in terms of the federal government and immigration uh, levels and targets for 2016-2020, uh, those targets for Canada between 2017 and 2020 show a small increase in the total uh, number of immigration, between 300,000 to 340, uh, including protected uh, persons and refugees, 40 to 48,000. Uh, these targets are significantly lower than the actual uh, levels experienced in 2016, as shown in the highlighted sections. In 2016, over 58,000 uh, protected persons and refugees arrived in Canada, which represents about 20% of all immigrants, compared to the 43,000 planned for uh, 2018, which represents uh, just uh, over 13.9%. The 2017 and 2020 uh, levels plan also include a greater proportion of people arriving as privately sponsored refugees. In 2016, uh, privately sponsored refugees accounted uh, for just over 30% of all refugees and it, plan, and it planned for 2018 to be just over 40%. With regards to uh, city services and supports, it um, should be made clear that the city does not directly provide any programs uh, specific to refugees and immigrants, uh, whether Syrian or from other countries. However, uh, many are served through existing programs uh, open to eligible residents, and as such, services to refugees are part of the regular ongoing operations. The ways that the city uh, does support refugees and immigrants are highlighted on the slide. Uh, programs and services that are available to all eligible residents but that are tailored uh, to respond to unique populations uh, needs such as immigrants and uh, newcomers include uh, 311 language lines uh, which have translators available to converse in over 170 languages. By building a workforce that is representative of the community it serves including hiring newcomers providing training to staff to help them better understand the needs of immigrants as well as recognize uh, the skills, experience, and knowledge that immigrants bring to the community, and uh, systematically coordinating our services and strategic initiatives with partners such as post-secondary educations, institutions, sorry. Providing uh, funding with current municipal mandate. Uh, in 2018, community funding invested uh, just under a million dollars in nine agencies and programs that serve immigrants. And uh, leadership through uh, the appointment uh, of myself, as well as uh, convening community leaders to respond to Syrian refugee crisis on the mayor's task force uh, for Syrian refugees. And of course, we know the fundraising efforts of uh, United for Refugees Fund, with, uh, which raised about a uh, million dollars. Concretely, some examples of the city's efforts over the past three years include um, the mayor's working group on refugee resettlements and we meeting with local MPs and MPPs who have uh, played a big role in assisting and getting funding for various uh, programs, uh, hosting or co-hosting a variety of events including uh, the mayor's public forum on refugee resettlement which was the first step on October 1st, 2015. We had a welcome event for Syrian newcomers on May 28th of 2016. We've also hosted uh, career fairs for the newcomers, including the Pathways to Employment uh, Career Fair on June 16, 2016, where we saw a lot of uh, businesses from the local community step up and offer to open their shops to employ uh, Syrian newcomers. And of course, World Refugee Day event on June 20th of 2016. 
Ottawa Public Health um, organized immunization and dental clinics as well as assessments and other health services in the initial uh, period uh, of the uh, settlement. Uh, Parks, Rec, Cultural and Facility Services staff worked with Refugee 613 to build a volunteer management system. And I know OC Transpo as well hosted uh, various clinics to uh, teach newcomers how to use our bus systems. Uh, with regards to requests for assistance in terms of refugee access to cities administered uh, programs, the bulk of requests is around financial support. So Ontario Works, uh, as many of you know, is administered by Community and Social Services, but is funded by the provincial government. Uh, resettled refugees and refugee claimants are eligible for Ontario Works, assuming they meet the program criteria. As of November 2017, 325 Syrian refugee households applied for Ontario Works. This represents about 54% of all Syrian refugees that came to Ottawa during this time period. Emergency uh, shelters, less than five families required an emergency shelter, and I've been advised it is only for uh, short periods of uh, time. This speaks to the great work that the community did in ensuring uh, the proper support and resources for those families. While the purpose was to provide an update on the uh, Syrian efforts, I thought it was appropriate as well to touch on some of the current trends that we're seeing. Uh, there have been some media attention about the pressure primarily in Montreal and Toronto. Uh, we know some other cities are experiencing some increases in demands as well. Uh, here in Ottawa, we saw increased demand for em emergency shelter placement uh, beginning in the summer of 2017 due to uh, refugee claimants originating in the United States. Uh, and the demand was steady from June to November 2017 when it leveled off. However, the demand has since increased in April of 2018. And we are operating within our current uh, resources. Housing uh, Services is monitoring the requests uh, and trends. Uh, and we're also participating in regular discussions at the provincial level and with other cities uh, related to border response, hearing uh, process, and understanding the capacity and demand available. In terms of uh, next steps, uh, the city staff continue to work uh, in close partnership with community agencies uh, to monitor trends and collectively address emerging issues such as mental health and employment. Uh, representatives from community and social services as well as other departments uh, participate on the local uh, planning tables, Refugee 613 and the Ottawa Local Immigration Partnership. And in closing, uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, the, once again the tremendous community effort that has taken place uh, over the last couple of years. Um, the showcase a great collaboration across partners resulting in positive outcomes for our new residents and ultimately our welcoming community. It took many uh, partners to have the impact that we saw in Ottawa and I want to congratulate uh, Refugee 613, OLIP uh, for their leadership role in coordinating and supporting the community's resettlement uh, effort. We are fortunate uh, that Ottawa has a strong pre-existing network of settlement agencies and I want to acknowledge the Catholic Centre for Immigrants and all of the LASI or local agencies serving immigrants uh, partners for delivering excellent service to refugees over many months of extremely high demand, assisting them with uh, securing housing and providing the necessary supports. Addressing health concerns and enrolling children in school was often a uh, key first step for individuals and families arriving, and community agencies such as the Community Health and Resource Center and the school boards played an essential role in meeting those initial needs as well as connecting individuals to the broader community. Thousands of residents also came uh, forward to support the resettlement efforts, whether as private sponsors, donors, or volunteers. So on behalf of uh, the city and, and the mayor, I'd like to thank everyone who played and continues to play a role in helping newcomers settle and build uh, a life here in Ottawa. And that concludes uh, the presentation, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you very much. Questions? Councillor Elson Thierry? Just a quick question, first of all. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Councillor, and thank you, Mayor, for uh, the support uh, to the refugee. But uh, is the organization you're working with, are they keeping track of uh, people returning since the war almost, almost to some degree, somebody can say, has stopped? So do we have a record of people returning home? 
I don't have a number off the top of my head, but I think we would be able to get that perhaps from, uh, you know, Carl Nicholson at at the Catholic Immigration Center. But um, as far as I know, and I don't know if Claire uh, has any numbers, but uh, as far as I know, the majority are are staying here. Are staying? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that was my question as well, so thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Councillor, and to our staff, uh, you know, Janice and Clara, who helped uh, support this initiative. Um, you know, I, I just um, uh, what struck me was uh, how the community really opened its arms and its heart and its wallets to help these people in desperate need. And um, while I'm not trying to uh, sugarcoat the fact there's still some real challenges ahead for language barriers and employment opportunities, uh, I'll just tell you one story. I was at a, um, uh, I think it was the um, uh, child care uh, fundraising brunch at Easter uh, in, in Councillor DeRuz's ward, and they have a, it was at the arena, and I was uh, just watching this hockey game, and this uh, hockey dad came over to me and proudly said that uh, a young Syrian boy who was eight years old scored the winning goal for his team at the championship. And I thought, you know, boy, here's a kid who probably obviously never skated before, uh, is really integrating into Canada's national sport, and uh, you're making friends along the way. So. Uh, thank you for the report, and we appreciate uh, the good work. We know that we still have work to do, particularly as we see the challenges at the Montreal border and um, the impact it may uh, have on our community. So thank you for that. Uh, our next presentation is uh, Ottawa 2017 final update. This will be basically items three and four. Uh, Michael Crockett, President and CEO of uh, Ottawa Tourism, and Guy Laflamme, who, uh, as I mentioned, he's here is a volunteer now because he's officially uh, retired and uh, we welcome him back and uh, thank him for what was uh, quite a remarkable year for our, our city and our country. So we'll get them settled up and then the next item after this is the uh, Brownfields Grant Program application. Uh, Uh, there's no delegations for the library one, so we'll go to the, one, the next one that has delegations. Oh, sorry, I thought you were asking. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Mr. Crockett, Monsieur Laflamme, bienvenue, welcome. Bonjour, Monsieur le maire. Bonjour, uh, l'ensemble des membres du Conseil municipal. Et merci pour cette opportunité de vous faire part des résultats d'Ottawa 2017. Uh, avant d'aborder les résultats, j'aimerais uh, encore une fois remercier le maire Watson et l'ensemble du Conseil municipal pour votre incroyable appui uh, tout au long de l'année et uh, pour la planification d'Ottawa 2017 et particulièrement le conseiller Cloutier, conseiller Fleury, uh, qui était uh, co-président de l'implication de la ville d'Ottawa sur les célébrations d'Ottawa 2017. Merci également au personnel de la ville d'Ottawa, euh, Steve Kanalakis, Dan Brisebois, euh, Amanda Mullen, euh, qui ont fait un travail exceptionnel pour nous appuyer dans la mise en œuvre des célébrations. Et un merci tout particulier à la police d'Ottawa. Le fait qu'on a terminé l'année avec les millions de personnes qui ont assisté aux événements sans qu'il y ait aucun incident est vraiment un témoignage de la qualité euh, du service de police de la ville d'Ottawa. Et euh, Merci à l'ensemble des gens qui sont ici et même euh, un merci particulier aux médias qui nous ont appuyés pour euh, faire en sorte que les gens soient au courant de tout ce qui était offert dans le cadre de nos célébrations. So I, just to start, uh, just to remind you about uh, some of the high moments of 2017, uh, allow us to show you the wrap-up video that we did of our celebration. Video, video. Okay, the beauty of technology. I prefer to have those challenges now rather than last year. Thank you. 
I hope this video is generating as much goosebumps on your skin as it is on mine. Um, I think it's still surreal that we managed to pull it off and to implement every page of the 400-page business plan that I wrote in the summer of 2014. Um, going back to the objectives we were given by the City of Ottawa and Ottawa City Council uh, to report on what we've achieved, we were asked to uh, secure 100% of uh, the financing uh, required, uh, of the objective was $20 million. Uh, remind you that we started with a budget, annual budget of $300,000 a year when I started in May 2014. We managed to generate a uh, total offerings of more than $40 million. Half of that money came from private sector and self-generated revenues with the sales of uh, tickets for some of our events. And this was as a result of securing over 400 partners, uh, regional, national, international organizations. Uh, we were asked to um, produce a minimum of 10 new major events. We generated over 200 new events over the course of the year, 3,100 hours of programming, that's the equivalent of 8.5 hours per day, with a team, may I remind you, of 18 people. So things like Continuum, which allowed us to showcase Confederation Line, but also position Ottawa as a technology city. And we were finalists in South by Southwest, and we won an award as the best multimedia event against thousands of uh, organizations around the world. The success of Picnic on the Bridge, celebrating the unification of what used to be called Upper and Lower Canada. Um, uh, Ottawa welcomes the world. We were aiming for 25 embassies. We ended up with 97 embassies came on board for the event. Niwate, uh, how we honored indigenous people, big success, and also giving people the opportunity to access Shadier Falls. Canada's Table, which was a sellout in two seconds. Uh, La Machine, it was the biggest success of the year, but it also not only allowed to create an amazing community spirit, but to showcase the beauty of architecture of downtown Ottawa. And um, uh, Red Bull Crashed Ice, where 200,000 brave people uh, faced the minus 1,000 degree temperature to uh, celebrate our passion for ice and hockey. And uh, Agri 150, we had 20 different artistic culinary events in rural Ottawa to celebrate the fact that 90% of our land is rural and we showcase the beauty and the quality of products that we offer in rural Ottawa. We were asked to um, put in place at least uh, two new events in each ward. We managed to generate 107 events in 23 wards and that's not counting what we did as part of the Juno Awards and just aspects that are not as well known about about some of our accomplishments, more social components of our accomplishments, uh, we promoted diversity at a time where there were all kinds of racial tensions uh, around the world with the success of Ottawa Welcomes the World and the partnership we did with OLEP. Um, we celebrated indigenous culture. Uh, people from indigenous communities didn't want to necessarily celebrate the 150th, but they saw this as an opportunity to further educate people about the mistakes made in history, and that's what we did by including them in pretty much every single major event. So from December 31st, Junior Awards, we etc. Um, promote agriculture and local products. Uh, and again, most of those events, the 20 events, were a sell-off and we will be repeating some of them moving forward. Uh, positioning Ottawa as a technology city, as we did with Miwate, with Continuum. Um, being able to feature local talent 
Parliament with the Juno Awards, with Inspiration Village, uh, La Machine, uh, where all the talent were local. We managed to engage over a thousand bands, a thousand artists from our community. Uh, celebrating youth, uh, all four school boards were involved, all colleges and universities, in which uh, our social fabric, uh, we worked with the Ottawa Mission, we worked with different charity and food banks. Uh, we created a meeting place to foster an, an enhanced level of pride and community spirit and to uh, being able to engage all levels of our community, BIAs, community centers, schools, chambers of commerce, volunteers, arts, cultural organization. I challenge you to come up with any name of organization who were not part of the celebration. So it was not Ottawa 2017 celebration, it was the entire Ottawa community output which generated this event. We painted the town Ottawa 2017, the new pageantry program that we created will benefit whenever we host major events in the future. We wanted to make Ottawa the hub of the 150th celebration and I think that's what we accomplished uh, with the renewed sense of uh, image and the prestige brand that we created. So proud that we won against Montreal uh, 370, uh, 375th uh, despite the fact that they had way more resources than we had. We won the award with the best campaign, promotional campaign in the country awarded by the CTC and the fact that I'm being invited in Korea, in Holland, in the United States, all across Canada and Brazil to present the results of Ottawa 2017 and I'll be the keynote speaker for the closing of the International Festival and Events Association Conference, I think is a sign that we did something right. And now in terms of numbers, the great collaboration we have with Ottawa Tourism, uh, Michael will tell you about uh, quantitative aspects of our results. There's no question that Guy and his team delivered, and uh, you know our team at Ottawa Tourism is extremely grateful to Guy and his team for delivering, because it gave us an opportunity, but more than an opportunity, an obligation to take advantage of, of those events and the eyeballs that were on Ottawa in 2017. And so our team really worked hard to to make sure that we we took full advantage of this uh, this once in a once in a lifetime opportunity to promote Ottawa and to make sure that we were delivering the results that were uh, that were expected of us. And, uh, and we worked great with, with Guy's team, very integrated on the marketing and communication side of things, and, and the results were extremely positive. Uh, 11 million visitors, that's a record by any metric that we, can, that we have to, to measure. 11 million people came to Ottawa, that's up 8.8% on 2016, which itself was a record year. Uh, Canadian visitors up 8.7 percent, U.S. visitors up 7.8 percent, and uh, maybe most telling, international visitors up 10.9 percent. So some of the things that the Guy's team was doing really did resonate with international visitors, which is exciting. And when you think about the, the ROI for, for what, uh, for what uh, 20, Auto 2017 was able to do in our community, $2.3 billion were spent in our community by visitors in 2017, which is up 10.3 percent. That's uh, an incredible amount of additional spending, almost a quarter of a, uh, of a billion dollars more in spending than was done in the previous year. So, uh, And that doesn't say anything about what locals did and the impact on locals in Ottawa as well. So very, very uh, incredible uh, positive impact for, for Ottawa. Uh, some of the highlights from, from our team uh, taking advantage of the, uh, the, uh, the focus on Ottawa last year uh, are social media numbers grew uh, incredibly. Uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, there was incredible conversations taking place about Ottawa during, during 2017. Uh, the, our website uh, blew all previous records out of the water in terms of people coming to find out information about Ottawa as well, so almost 5 million uh, views for, for our website. Uh, the media coverage reached over 270 million people uh, in, in 2017, including uh, one of the, the, the highlights of the year was the piece in the New York Times, 36 Hours in Ottawa. Uh, but also we reached into the UK, The Guardian focused on Ottawa. Uh, the Los Angeles Times with an award-winning article calling uh, Ottawa cool with a capital C, which really goes to what Guy was talking about, about changing the way that people think about Ottawa. Uh, Le Soleil talking about Ottawa, um, Vogue, uh, Vogue talking about a restorative weekend away in Ottawa, the Montreal Gazette talking about the food scene in Ottawa, again changing the way that people think about, about our community. 
Uh, and in terms of meetings and conventions, it was a record year for, for our community. More meetings, more conventions here, and more international conventions. We moved up from 33rd spot in North America in terms of international conventions up to 14th in 2017. Uh, so we are do, doing the right things to attract those, those big events. And not all of them are international. Last year, of course, we hosted the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and also Association of Municipalities of Ontario, two really significantly large events here in our community. And we thank the city for, for partnering with us on both of those. Uh, of course, the sporting events that which took place here, uh, it would take far too long to go through all of them. A couple of big ones ending the year with the Grey Cup, of course, and the NHL 100 Classic, uh, but, but just dozens and dozens more of national championships and international events uh, as well. And one of the questions we get is, what was the full impact of, uh, of 2017? And right now, we've just launched an economic impact study, and in a few months, we'll have the results of, of what the tourism impact is in, in Ottawa. So we know the approximate amount of money that was spent here. We know the approximate number of visitors, and we're going to get some more detailed information uh, in the coming months as well. Uh, and the mayor has announced these uh, new funds that are facilitated through the municipal accommodation tax. This is one of the great legacies of Ottawa 2017 as well, that we'll have the ability to invest in events and invest in, in, in more conferences and conventions and to invest in new uh, innovative ideas through the Destination Development Fund. So we're grateful to the city for, for having the confidence in, in Ottawa tourism to be able to, to do that for the community as well. Uh, the question we get the most often is, what's next in terms of the legacy of the 2017 events. And so uh, certainly Ottawa Welcome to the World uh, looks like it will be coming back over the July uh, long weekend. We have already uh, transitioned uh, hundreds of volunteers from Ottawa 2017 into an ongoing volunteer pool for, for future events and current events. We have also just finished uh, the updating of the, uh, the Host 150 program, which is a frontline customer service training program, which is now available for, uh, for tourism uh, uh, businesses and members in, uh, in Ottawa. We are in the stages of uh, working out what the, uh, the, the agri-events will be for the rural parts of Ottawa, but that is going to take place again this year for sure. Uh, the Ignite 150 will be uh, integrated now into our Destination Development Funds. So there's opportunities for funding uh, to support some of those innovative, crazy ideas that, uh, that Guy's team really fostered in, uh, in 2017. Uh, we're still working on Mawate and on Picnic on the Bridge. Uh, Sky Lounge may be one of those ones that now just has a private sector solution where someone can come and, and sell tickets for, for dinner on, in the sky. Uh, and one that may, may, may not come back in the, sh the short term anyways is the uh, Global Rally Cross. Uh, the company that was operating that is, uh, has become insolvent, so we're, we're not working with them anymore at this point in time. And of course, the two biggest ones that we always get asked about are what about La Machine and what about Red Bull Crash Dice? And happy to say uh, both of those are very much um, uh, in the works in terms of the, the future uh, opportunities to bring them back. Um, 2020 uh, with uh, Red Bull Crash Dice is the most likely year for that to come back as it makes its circuit through, uh, through Canadian markets. And we're in touch with uh, the folks at Red Bull regularly. And uh, thanks to Guy, we've had the right introductions to, to La Machine and we've been working uh, closely with them and with the the French Embassy uh, over the last few months to work on what is the right, uh, the right way and the right timing for, for the next uh, iteration of, of, uh, of a La Machine Ottawa uh, relationship. So we're excited about, uh, uh, about the future for those events and we know the impact that they had in our community uh, in 2017. Et avec ça, en, en terminant, on veut vous laisser avec des images de la machine. Un documentaire est en voie de production par une firme euh, de la Chine. Les images sont vraiment des plus spectaculaires. Et ça vous permettra d'avoir une meilleure appréciation des foules qu'on a générées. La machine a été la plus importante production artistique dans l'histoire d'Ottawa. Euh, Lorsqu'on a dit que 750 000 personnes y avaient assisté, c'est probablement en réalité plus près du 1 million. Euh, le documentaire sera lancé à Ottawa, la première de la production sera euh, lancée à Ottawa euh, au début de l'automne parce que malheureusement le producteur a eu des problèmes cardiaques. Alors voici un court extrait du trailer qui a été fait pour euh, ce documentaire que l'on verra à Ottawa.
Vous savez, la production de la machine à Ottawa est maintenant la norme euh, au niveau international. Je suis en communication avec les gens de Toulouse qui vont accueillir la machine en novembre, presque sur une base euh, à chaque semaine, euh, alors qu'ils veulent apprendre et s'inspirer du modèle qui a été développé à Ottawa. Alors, encore une fois, merci, M. le maire, merci au conseil municipal pour votre appui d'avoir rendu tout ça possible. Wow, what a what a, uh, a way to end the presentation. First of all, uh, thank you, Guy. Um, you know, I often tell the story when Guy came into me with all of these ideas. He said, "We're going to put a spider on the ro the Catholic Basilica, and then the dragon's going to fight the spider on the lawn of the Supreme Court. We're going to shut down Wellington Street for a dinner for a thousand. Uh, we're going to have Red Bull crashed ice next to the Chatelet." I thought he was on drugs the whole time. How can we possibly do all this? Every single thing that he promised, he delivered, and as you saw on. We'll see on item number four, uh, all of the funds uh, were balanced out to net zero from the City of Ottawa, and you doubled the number of dollars received from other levels of government in the private sector. So, bravo. We're very, very proud. Thank you very, very much, and enjoy your retirement. And, and as well to Michael, your team were just fantastic, stepped up to the plate, and it was a, a great opportunity. Uh, I just wanted to mention one thing, and then we'll go to questions. One of the things I noticed about La Machine, I met so many people. I was down in the market and downtown uh, every day for La Machine because I was mesmerized with it like 750,000 other people. And I met so many people from suburban communities, Canada, Orleans, Barhaven, that actually told me it was the first time they'd come downtown in a long time because they'd always thought, you know, parking problems and so on. And they rediscovered or discovered new restaurants and new shops. And then uh, the reverse of that, so many people from the urban core going out to suburban and rural Ottawa, in particular SunTech Tomatoes, that one of the pictures you showed. We always hear about SunTech Tomatoes on the radio ads, but people had this beautiful uh, three-course dinner uh, amongst the tomato plants in the greenhouses in February. It was just magical. And we saw that with the, uh, uh, the Secret Eats uh, program that went into rural Ottawa and people were going to visit breweries and, and wineries that uh, they had no idea existed. So I think it was a great way to get people from different parts of the city to discover their own city, uh, you know, above and beyond the international and national tourists that came to us. Councillor Deans, question? My question is actually number four. Are we taking them all together or? Uh, yeah, we can do that. Sure. Okay. Um, but maybe before I ask my question, I'll just say to you, Gabe, that it was a spectacular year, and it is amazing what you pulled off. And if I ever need a really good party planner, I think I know who to call. Um, so what do you do for an encore, personally? Uh, live a simple and quiet life. Um, I, I will be, for the next few months, traveling the world as I have had all those invitations to share our success story. Um, but beyond that, I just want to retire and spend time with my family and enjoy our place in the Magdalene Islands uh, as well as living in Ottawa in Blackburn Hamlet. A very well deserved retirement. Thank, so you. thank you for thank all you. you did to showcase Ottawa. Um, my question, uh, I'm not sure who's going to ask. Uh, answer this, but item number four, it didn't, it was silent on cost recovery for OPS services and EPS services from the federal government. And I just wondered if we um, have um, come to an agreement on cost recovery for emergency services with the federal government. I think that's more of a staff question. Uh, is Dan Brisbois or Steve? Mr. Mayor, th this, uh, that particular topic is not actually directly related to the subject of this particular report, but I'll endeavor to talk to Mr. DeMonte and we'll have an answer to the Council prior to Council if that's acceptable. Okay. Um, I mean, it was the 2017 final report, so I think it seems fair to ask if we manage cost recovery on emergency services. Well, I think on, on document one it shows the cash contributions in kind. And uh, my understanding is that uh, all of the bills have been paid to police and paramedic service, and it's reflected in the fact that it balanced the six, six uh, million and two, or 6.002 uh, income and 6.002 expenses. So the last uh, board meeting we had, I think Mr. Coutier, who's on the audit committee, uh, we did um, receive confirmation that all of the bills have been paid. That, that is correct, Mr. 
like from the federal government did they reimburse us for for the emergency services well we always get reimbursed for Canada Day um, they gave us um, five million dollars uh, as part of their contribution so well, I think you, I was understanding you were asking about the Ottawa police um, they're all because in terms of our um, the services that we received from um, City of Ottawa services, Ottawa Police, and all other sectors, uh, we contrib we paid probably in the order of two million dollars in different services provided by the city, and we paid the same way as any external events would have paid. So those bills have all been uh, paid. Uh, but in terms of uh, federal government and services provided by the city to Canada Day, uh, I, I'm not involved okay. with that. Okay, thank you. And, and my understanding also is that any um, assets that were not sold uh, are the property now of Ottawa Tourism, like the light system and so on. But you sold a fair amount of you know, everything from, I guess, fire extinguishers to, to wood. Yep, to be able to balance our budgets, everything was sold back. We managed to recover what we paid for the furniture, uh, the very frugal furniture we had in our office, and all the equipment that we acquired for uh, the productions. Dee brought us a lot of printer paper. <laughs> I appreciate that. Is there any other questions? No. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. So uh, on item four, uh, which is the final report uh, received. See. Okay. So our uh, next item is um, item number twelve because we have uh, members of the public to speak to that. And we have a presentation uh, with Leanne uh, Sneddon and Richard Buchanan. So I think if we... and uh, Matthew Fleury, who are council appointed two co-chairs of 2017. They put a lot of effort into their responsibilities, and we thank them. I don't think they're here, but in absentia, thank them. Okay. Mr. Mayor, I have Mr. Buchanan and Mr. James with me today. I am going to provide some opening remarks and then turn the short presentation over to Mr. Buchanan. The old Dom Tar lands are the primary reason why cities develop brownfields programs. These are contaminated lands on a derelict site in the city's urban core. This truly is the poster child for a brownfield grant. Building on our recent 2017 celebration presentation today, the city really does benefit in many ways from the new Zibi development. Build that will create 750 million worth of assessed value. Currently, we are collecting $207,000 in property taxes. A few questions have come up asking whether this development would have gone ahead without this grant. This is a question, of course, for Windmill. However, I suspect this grant is, at a minimum, helping to speed up progress to make the vision of Zibi a reality. The reality for the city is increased taxes, which at full build-out, Council will be collecting $18 million instead of $200,000 per year. Committee and Council, if approved, will be making an investment with positive returns that are likely to begin to be realized in as early as 12 years. From a financial and urban development and environmental point of view, the admittedly $60 million grant is in the public interest. This is polluted land that has been underdeveloped for many years, and there are buildings with heritage value that will be repurposed. This site meets the goals of our planning policies. The question has also come up 
Why Zibi and not Lebreton Flats? Lebreton Flats is a federal government owned NCC land and the Brownfields program is not intended to fund any other levels of government. Zibi purchased these lands from Don Tile. Don Tarp, the holder of the lands for the past hundred years. The federal government had no control over these lands, so were not responsible for the contamination that took place. The cleanup of this site will make this development a dynamic part of the city's urban fabric and will contribute to our vision of making Ottawa the most livable mid-sized city in North America. Mr. Buchanan is now going to take you through a technical um, piece around uh, some of the property ownership. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, committee members, before you have a Brownsville application for 3 and 4 Booth Street, and which is put forward by Windmill June Holdings Limited. Before you, uh, the following is a plan showing the pre-development land ownership. And uh, as indicated by the green areas, these were federally owned properties, but Domtar had long-term nine-year leases to use these lands. The uh, black dashed areas it replicates the Domtar land ownership outright. So actually to the top left you'll notice the uh, light gray lines and that deals with uh, Hydro Ottawa properties. This is the proposed development. The above plan shows the extent of development being proposed. The green areas to the east and west ends of Shadier Island are proposed parks um, and they'll remain in NCC ownership. There's approximately, well, there's actually 1,121 condominium residential developments with mixed use development of over 11,700 square meters of retail space and 66,500 square meters of office space. So, this, this brownfield redevelopment application is the largest single request since the program started in 2007, but it should be the matter of the, it replicates the intent, the full intent of the Brownsfield program in terms of every aspect. So the total estimated cost for the windmill to rehabilitate this and remediate the site is over $121 million. So therefore the estimated maximum grant eligible under the program is over $60 million. Part of that $60 million is development charge credits that uh, makes up over $21 million, and that's included in the $60 million. So development charges don't, don't start until building permits are actually issued, and rehab grants don't occur until there's an uplift in the property taxes. So there's an investment in the economy in terms of $360 million in construction value, and as uh, Jan has stated, the existing annual property taxes is $207,000. And after full build-out, uh, it can be expected of $18 million per year present-day value. One second. Okay. So, and that, that ends the uh, presentation. Questions? Uh, Councillor uh, El Chantiri. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, maybe so much to our staff and maybe to the treasurer. Uh, and, and I know this is a policy we have, and about the, the you know the cleaned up. But if let's see if, if the city didn't. Uh, uh, Include or, or participate in the, in the cleanup. What would that happen to the the social housing component on that side? The um, uh, cost for the developer would be obviously higher, and in order to recoup uh, those costs, most likely they would not be able to put affordable housing on the site. They would have to charge more for. Uh, what they're going to build, so that would preclude, I would think, any type of affordable housing. Can you uh, just enlighten me, what would be the percentage of social housing uh, in that development? Mr. Mayor, the uh, target for affordable housing is 7%. With 1,200 units, that equates to approximately 84 units of affordable housing. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. That's a good question, Councillor Eglon. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the presentation, especially clearing up the issues around ownership in the federal government and, and, and that sort of piece. Um, when you use the term target, um, does that mean that's where we'd like them to get or where they've committed to get? Mr. Mayor, that is what they've committed to, to achieve. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, and um, this is a lot of money, obviously, and, and we, we've seen that there's a benefit to it. And, and um, in terms of tax revenue, and as, as Councillor Sanchez pointed out, there's going to be some, some positive impact in terms of the, um, the affordable housing that's going to be built on site as well. Um, I do know that from talking to uh, Mr. Willis, though, that there, uh, other cities have different models about how they, they do this. For example, some, some have an overall cap uh, uh, for the whole program, not necessarily per project, but for the whole program over a, over a given term. Um, other cities look at different um, conditions, if you will, around. Uh, so, um, and again, I've, I've talked to Mr. Will, so maybe he can, he can take this answer, but um, I'm assuming there's no objection if, if this committee was to direct you to do a, do a review going into next term of our program um, uh, to come back with, with a report on how other cities are doing it and, and what suggestions you might have uh, to not get rid of the program because I think it does, does good work and, and, uh, and uh, helps us to uh, take properties that otherwise wouldn't be done, but maybe give us some suggestions about how other cities do it and enhancements that we could do uh, for our program. Is that a direction that you could accept today? Mr. Mayor, like all of our funding programs, it's actually normal for us to do, re do reviews at five-year segments, and the five fifth year would be coming up around the second term of the next council. We are also looking at starting a review of all of the economic development grant funding programs in the next term just to assess where they're at and fine-tune and tweak them. So um, if committee were to give that direction, it would be consistent with what we intended to put in our own work well, program. I'm happy to give that direction. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Wilkinson, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of questions on the financing of this. I take it the $60 million of that property is 50% of the cost because the owner, so this is going to cost over $120 million. Uh, the, the grant is for up to $60 million. And just to clarify in terms of that figure, um, that's a maximum amount uh, when uh, when Mill goes forward and actually performs all the remediation. The city only pays actual costs. So if they go above what has been estimated, they will not be compensated for that. So this is a limit we're putting on it. But that, and that's just 50% of what we expect they're going to have to pay. That is correct. Okay. Now, of that... The $21 million for the D.C.s surprised me because the Treasurer told me that uh, we had a couple of years ago decided not to include D.C. revenue in this, and I'm wondering why it is this one and whether we still have to do what I was told before. If we forgive D.C. money, then we have to budget within our budget to put that money in from city, from city costs as a city cost because we need that money for DCs for the future project. I think maybe the Treasurer would be the best one to answer this, Mr. Mayor, because I talked to her about this a while back and was told that we had made a change that we were no longer including DCs. We did make a change to the program, but this is a, a site that was grandfathered because they actually had their application in before we made the change. So there were a number of sites that, that we grandfathered and they were allowed to continue under the old rules where we are using development charges as one of the ways to uh, pay them back for uh, half of the work that they're undertaking. The, yes, you have to, we've uh, agreed through the planning committee that when you, uh, council exempts uh, a property from having to pay a development charge, the city taxes make up the difference so that the DC accounts are not affected. You already have a base budget of $6 million a year, and we review it annually to determine if it's sufficient. And if it isn't, we actually put in uh, a request to increase it in a year. So that account of $6 million right now would be what we would use to repay the $21 million in development charges, which council will be paid back to them over roughly a 20-year period. It's a 20-year period, but the tax ex property tax exemption is just 10 years. I, as, that's, uh, I mean, the DCs are going to be needed before 20 years if they're already in the bylaw. 
we collect, but we only collect DCs when a building permit is taken out. So they will get reimbursed their DCs when the building permits are taken out. So you're correct. We need the DCs now. We'd love to get uh, developers to prepay DCs, but that's not how it works. So it's as the development, uh, as the developer comes in and draws the building permit, which we expect to take uh, place over a long period of time. So is there, is there a, t a time limit for that of doing the DCs? Like if it goes on for 30 years, do we still do it for 30 years? There is a time limit, and then Mr. Buchanan can refresh me. Is it 10 or 20? It's 10. It's 10 year period. 10 years. So any building permits in the next 10 years would have that. After that, they would not be exempted anymore. That's correct. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Just wanted to clarify that. To help Mr. Mayor, just to clarify, that's per phase. So there's five phases of development, and each phase will have a 10-year horizon. That's correct. So this, okay. is a, yeah, this is a total of five uh, phases, then that's uh, 60 million. So. Okay. And, the, uh, and I agree with what Councilor you guys said. I think a review of this is probably long. It's been long enough. We have a lot of experience with it now. Sure. I know originally staff were going to get 100% reduction, and I kind of balked at that, and they... They looked at it again and we got it down to 50% so they are paying, because they usually pay less for the land that is contaminated. So it's a shared thing now and I think that's the best way to go. And, and Councillor Eggwise's direction has been given to staff, so thank you. Uh, Councillor McKinney, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I just want to, uh, two things, on the affordable housing, the commitment, I take it then we've got that in writing. Um, can you just tell me the details of it in terms of the uh, affordability aspects, the, how much will go to the 40th percentile, the 30th, and then the deep subsidy into the 20th percentile? Uh, Mr. Mayor, that's probably a question better asked uh, to the applicant. It's just uh, they have a commitment to provide 7% <coughs> for affordable housing uh, uh, on, their, on their development. Um, I guess in with respect to um, the, the, the affordable rents uh, with respect to uh, both the official plan and CMHC um, data, but uh, probably the best person to, to uh, through their delegation to answer that would be the applicant. Their, their first stop. Okay, yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask that question then. Um, just back to the land ownership, and if we can go back to slide two, I believe it was. Um, and I'm not sure if this has changed between reports. I have two reports. One seems to have uh, uh, changed a bit, but on the one I'm looking at, page 30, uh, it does show uh, these parcels here, about 20% that were, that are pre-development land ownership was NCC, is that correct? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's, it's the green that's on the, on the plan here. Okay. Roughly, what, 20%, I guess? Mr. Mayor, that would be a good estimate, yeah. yes. And did staff ever make any attempt, or do we ever make any attempt when we're dealing with land that was either federally owned and or managed at some point uh, to uh, have them take responsibility for, um, uh, for uh, cleanup? No, Mr. Mayor, the Brownsfield program uh, is not uh, based uh, from its initiation back in 2006 in the uh, city seeking to recover from those who contaminated the land. And how do you see this as different than from Le Breton Flats? Uh, Mr. Mayor, with, with the lands here, um, the, they were in what would be called uh, fee simple ownership. Uh, so therefore, um, the federal government was not responsible for had or any control over uh, the contamination that Dom Tar uh, went forward with when, in their ownership of these lands. So uh, I think which is very different from uh, Le Breton moving forward. Le Breton has federal current government ownership and, and uh, control of those lands. Uh, so we definitely see this as a, a different situation, apples and oranges. But I just, uh, just referring back to the report, it does say the lands in green will be transferred from Public Works to NCC and then to Windmill. So they are federal lands that are to be transferred. Um, they're not, there is some responsibility for another level of government, I would see here, to uh, take responsibility for cleanup. I mean, we could put hairs on the, the exact type of ownership, but 
I would argue that uh, that the federal government on uh, any time that they sell lands and they make a profit on that, they should probably sell us or sell an applicant clean lands. Mr. Mayor, it's my understanding that the lands in green uh, were subject to a, a long-term or perpetual lease, uh, but that the land, as, as Ms. Dedden said, the lands were under the effective management control of the private sector, uh, I believe, well back into the late uh, 1800s, Mr. Mayor, unlike the Breton, which of course is under the control of the federal government today. Okay, thank you. I'll leave it at that, and I'll ask my questions about uh, affordable housing. Okay. Uh, Councillor Taylor, please. Thanks very much, and uh, appreciate the presentation and the answers you've given uh, so far. They do help clear up uh, a bunch of questions, I think, that a lot of folks had. Um, I, you know, I, I'm in support of the application. It's a big application, certainly much bigger than we've ever seen, but it, in my view, it's still fulfills the spirit of why the program was created. Um, my question, I guess, maybe really dovetailing off of Councillor Eagli and, and Councillor Wilkinson's has more to do with our future capacity to respond to other applications. Uh, not that this necessarily sets a size precedent, but looking around the uh, tapestry of, of Ottawa, are there other brownfield sites that we are aware of that may be forthcoming in the next several years over the uh, the lifetime perhaps of the payout of this one where we could be in a position where you know finance tells us well if we respond to this brownfield application now you know for site X given that we're still paying out on this one you know now we're getting into an area where um, you know the revenue isn't quite what we expected it to be because we haven't achieved the property value tax uplift yet so so my question is that you know, does this, how does this impact our ability to respond to future large applications should they come down? Uh, Mr. Mayor, the, there likely could be still some future uh, applications that will come through. It will really depend on, um, you know, what source of contaminations there are in various land, land ownerships. Um, however, I, I think certainly from the perspective of responding to these, this definitely is a large one. We've had a few larger ones in the previous years. Um, however, um, you know, we really view this and, and, uh, as, as an investment in moving forward in terms of spurring on the development that may not have taken place where we're able to increase the uh, property tax base. Okay, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, I guess just to, to circle back to one of my previous questions, uh, so anything can come through the door at any time, uh, but you are not currently aware of, you know, another application sitting out there, another plot of land that could generate a, a $20 million, $30 million application. Is that accurate? Mr. Mayor, that is accurate as of today. No, we don't know of another one like that. No. Okay. Thank you. All right. Councillor Deans. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Well, I have received a number of pieces of correspondence in my office from people suggesting that the level of contamination on the site is actually um, possibly or probably less than uh, what... Um, is being suggested by the staff and apparently the um, the uh, environmental assessment that was done is over a decade old and it was simply updated by DST consulting so I guess and, and some groundwater level testing has actually indicated more recently that there's been a significant improvement in the groundwater. So before we write a check for $60 million, would it not be prudent for us to do a new study to assess at this current time the level of contaminants on that site? Mr. Mayor, that's a great question, and um, the studies and evaluations will continue to take place. Uh, contaminated soils are not likely to, to remedy themselves uh, with, the, with the water table issues. Uh, um, we will only be paying uh, for actual costs. So WINMO will be responsible for determining and assessing, and it's in their best interest to ensure whether there's contamination or not uh, in any of these uh, sources. Uh, so we will only be paying actual costs. So we won't be paying any more, uh, you know, if, if it is proven and demonstrated that there is not the contamination in the water sources that um, more recent studies may have demonstrated. But we'll be paying a lot of money, so wouldn't it be in the city's interest and in the tax? 
taxpayer's interest to ask for a new assessment before the work commences. Mr. Mayor, we won't be paying for anything until the work commences and property taxes are paid for a full year. So we will know then whether or not there's contamination. We, we will not be issuing any checks. But who is assessing? Who is assessing the contaminants and how those contaminants got there? I read one report that said the contaminants were actually trucked onto the site. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm not familiar with uh, the, the trucking onto the site, but just to let you know that uh, the site report that there are contaminants on, on the property, and I'm aware of the, uh, the water uh, sampling that was done. There was four wells that were done, and it showed that it is lessened, which, which is good. Um, some portions of the buildings uh, and some buildings on the site will be demolished, and there will be some further groundwater sampling and testing. Um, that was written in the report as a contingency. So those samples come back and show that, you know, it's actually the groundwater is cleaner. Um, then it actually shows um, it's gotten to be a better situation because one level of the, the island is actually higher than the other. It goes down. Uh, then Wind will get less money uh, through the remediation so that the um, that overall $60 million will, will go down so the city will actually be paying less because the site is actually cleaner than they thought. Thank you. Yeah, and, and just to, to clarify, uh, as you pointed out, Ms. Stenton, if... Uh, the, the, the city doesn't pay until the work is done and the invoices are verified, and it's, I'm assuming, the MOE that verifies that it's been done to the proper provincial standards. So that's the, the, the check in the whole system. Councillor Harder. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to uh, be reminded, how much did we spend on remediation for the Greystone site? Anybody remember that? Leanne, you might? But wasn't it the second highest that... I it's a 15 million, Mr. Mayor. Okay. I, I mean, I know that 60 million is a lot more than that, but I don't recall us having the conundrum. I do recall, because I was here when the Brownfield um, policy came into being, and why we did that. And it was so that we could have um, underdeveloped properties developed and contributing to the city in a significant way just in what they offered, but also in the taxes. For example, we have one coming up, 900 Albert. Right now we get uh, $4 million a year or something like that, and that's that's an example. Yes? Yeah, I just to say $8 million for 900 Albert for their grant program. Right, but we get, right now we get something like $4,000 a year in taxes. It's a ridiculously low amount. Developing that is going to mean that we're going to get $10 million a year in taxes. Greystone, okay. Contaminated, of course, uh, you know, my family roots in the area. I mean, from the dumps that were there and everything else, contamination. I mean, there isn't a benefit for a windmill to say that it's a lot worse than it is because they're paying half of it. So obviously, the, when we come to the point where we're contributing our amount, which again, I remind you why the brownfield policy exists, um, will be exactly what the costs are. Correct? That is correct. Yeah. And the other thing too is, just remind me, on uh, Councillor McKenney, I think, brought up the Greenland there. Is the city contributing any money at all to that, the Greenland that she pointed out? Yes, Mr. Mayor, that is part of the grant. The, the lands that the city is not contributing to is the parkland on either end mm -hmm. uh, that will remain in NCC ownership and the hydro lands above. Yeah. And for those of us who have been around here a long time and remember the years of Domtar when it was in full length, the, the level of contamination, of course, would be significant. But the other thing, too, is how much is this city going to spend on the Ottawa River remediation? 200 plus million dollars, okay? So let's just like give our little heads a shake here, okay? We've got Le Breton that's leaching, we're dealing with that. We've got this big thing in the middle of the river leaching, contaminants, and we're gonna spend 200 million dollars and yet we're not gonna support somebody who wants to develop, do a beautiful job on this crucial piece of land um, where green energy at its very best is being produced and we're not going to support our brownfield policy on it, it makes no sense to me. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay, so members of the public, we have uh, Taryn Glancy, a brownfields coordinator for Zibi. Uh, Taryn, sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Uh, if you can come 
Well, that's not Turin. That's Jeff West Indy. <laughs> All right. So we'll get you. Do you have a, a PowerPoint, uh, Mr. West Indy? So you'll have five minutes, and then followed by Lindsay Lambert, and then Peter Stockdale from the Fairleigh Community Association. Push the button there. Pousser le bouton. Merci pour l'opportunité de présenter notre projet ZB à vous. Uh, mon nom c'est Jeff Westendish, je suis le président de ZB. In five minutes or less, I'm going to give you a very quick briefing of the ZB project uh, and answer maybe with a bit more uh, uh, specific some of the questions that have been asked so that when you're talking to your constituents, then uh, uh, you have a full understanding of the project itself. Um, our vision for the project is very simple. We want to revitalize a vacant, dilapidated, contaminated industrial site into one of the world's most sustainable communities. Uh, the complexity of this site cannot be underestimated. Uh, it is a $1.5 billion project on 37 acres, sits on three islands in the middle of the Ottawa River and spans two provinces. And as everyone in this region knows, uh, that provincial border in the Ottawa River is an awful lot wider than it looks sometimes. Um, we have been noticed on the world stage. Uh, the master plan that was put forward, that was developed in partnership with the City of Ottawa, the NCC, uh, the City of Gatineau, or the Ville de Gatineau, and our Algonquin. Auckland Partners uh, won the best master plan community by the uh, Canadian Urban Institute, uh, uh, went on for and won the best uh, master plan community in North America by the American Planning Institute, and then further went to Durban, South Africa, and won the international planners' community uh, um, plan for the best master plan, or sorry, best master plan community on the planet. Uh, quite, uh, quite an honor for our region. Um, I want to brief, touch the brief on, or sorry. To touch briefly on one planet. Uh, you'll notice in, in uh, the resolution that we are asking that one planet uh, um, take the place of lead in the Brownfield program. One planet, to summarize it, uh, says that we have to live as if we only have one planet. Uh, everybody looks at me like I have uh, horns on my head when I say that and reminds me we only do have one planet. I remind them that if we all live like us, we need five. That is not sustainable. Um, one planet is lead on steroids, essentially, uh, and introduces uh, a whole social fabric to sustainability. Um, uh, the, the Brownfields application overview, one of, the, one of the very important things that is different about this Brownfield application than most that you have seen uh, is that Brownfield also, uh, the, the, the program also cover, covers heritage restoration. Sixty percent of the grant uh, for this program is, is targeted towards uh, taking old, vacant, dilapidated buildings uh, that represent the industrial history of our site. And you can see some, uh, a picture up here of what that site used to look like and bring them back to life and tell the story. Uh, this is a picture of the Elle uh, Machels, some, some women that uh, I think all young women, my daughters, are huge fans of the Elle Machels. They led the first organized labor strike in British North America and won against E.B. Eddy, uh, really pioneered women's rights. Um, E.B. Eddy himself, you can see with the square timbers. Uh, this, this, our, uh, uh, Ms. Stedden mentioned that our site is the poster child for the, for, for the Brownfields program. Uh, you all know that our city started on this site 200 years ago. It's been industrial ever since. Since 2006, it's been vacant. It's been fenced off, locked off, no access to the Ottawa River, paying $200,000 in municipal taxes. Uh, when we're completed, we will have um, the, the, probably the only urban waterfront area that, that the City of Ottawa will have and the Ville de Gatineau. As everyone here knows, we live in, an, in a waterfront city. Not many residents recognize we live in a waterfront city because we've turned our backs on the water. Our site is an ability to, uh, to um, reintroduce uh, the water to, uh, to our residents. Uh, it will be a sustainability showcase. Uh, and most importantly, it will be a celebration of Ottawa's history and heritage. The federal government has expropriated and demolished just about all of the industrial heritage that was remaining in Ottawa and Gatineau, with the exception of our site. Uh, the, the work that the City of Ottawa is doing allows us to recreate that industrial heritage and tell the story. Um, this is the only time I've ever presented to FEDCO as uh, um, a proponent. I've always been here as a uh, volunteer for an economic development organization. Uh, I do want to reinforce the economic benefits of this program. Uh, currently, this site generating $200,000 of taxes. When we're done, $18 million of taxes. The cost to the city, because it's a downtown urban site, there are no new roads that need to be built. 
the, the, the sewage infrastructure exists, the public transit infrastructure exists. That $18 million, if you compare it to generating $18 million in a suburban uh, development, uh, is, has a huge impact on, on uh, um, city coffers. So I'm, uh, I, I was... Um, I was fortunate to help the city uh, develop the Brownfields program. I worked with Hamilton, Kingston, Waterloo. Uh, many of you know I have a background in that industry, uh, and I think it continues to deliver value. So uh, I do think it's, it's, it makes sense to uh, review these programs on a regular basis. But the economic benefits to the city speak for themselves. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Um, questions? Uh, yep. Catherine. Um, go ahead. I think you, you have to leave. I do have to leave. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Um, just I wanted to follow up, of course, on the uh, affordable housing commitment and uh, just some of the specifics around uh, what that means. So is it 25 percent and, and at what uh, percentiles? I'm just thinking about the, the deeper subsidies as a opposed to the uh, affordability. Uh, a great question, uh, Councillor McKinney. I, I have uh, pinged my office to get that granularity. I know the 7% uh, is, is our commitment. Um, I don't have the granularity on the quartiles that we're targeting. Uh, I will have that to your office later today. My apologies, I can't answer it today. That's good. That's fine. I'll, I'll await the answer. Thank Thanks. you. Uh, so, Councillor Blay, please. Thanks very much, and I appreciate that uh, the answer I'm looking for probably has a lot to do with market conditions, et cetera. But when would you expect the complete a uh, completed project? I uh, we really hope sooner than later, but we are subject to, uh, to market conditions. So we've modeled the Ottawa portion of this project uh, um, as being fully completed in seven to eight years. Okay, and is your Expectation to begin building Ottawa first or concurrently with Gatineau? How is that going to, to roll out? Uh, the first residents will be moving on to the site in Gatineau this October. Yeah. Uh, we have just started construction on the first structures in, uh, in Ottawa as we speak. Uh, we're in for building permit right now, so we'll see uh, uh, both commercial and residential occupants on, on uh, the Ottawa side of the project next spring. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Great. Uh, Councillor Chernyshenko? I didn't have questions for the delegation. I was simply signaling that Councillor McKenney wanted to ask, and I was going to give her my seat. So. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, Councillor Harder, did you have a question? I already spoke. Okay. Councillor Deans? Thank you, and thanks for being here, Mr. Ostandi. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the contamination on the site with you a little bit because in some of the correspondence that I've been receiving in my office, um, one person wrote to me that although Le Breton Flats is dirty due to scrapyards and industries that left oil, PCBs, and other major contaminants in the soil, um, on the island it's a different story, that that was a pulp and paper operation using chlorides and sulfides, and those are water soluble and wash away. So this person says um, that they met with John Westine. Do you take it that's your, your dad? I'm guessing my brother, uh, okay. Jonathan, yeah. On February 2nd, 2015, pointed that out to him, and he replied um, that um, it's industrial fill that had been brought onto the site. So are you aware of that, and what kind of fill was that? Um, so the site has been industrial for a little over 200 years, Councillor Deans. Um, uh, it, it, uh, while it was pulp and paper for a while, uh, it was also a lumber industry, hydro generation, uh, and, and today we view industries as being very insular. Uh, so if we have a pulp and paper mill, it is just that mill. Uh, at the turn of the century, those mills had blacksmith shops, paint shops, uh, um, you know, plenty of hydrocarbons to fuel things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so they're much more fully integrated. Um, the site, there's 37 acres in total. Uh, I could spend 
an awful lot of time talking about the contamination, uh, but there are areas of the site where no fill has been brought in. There are areas of the site where uh, the river was actually filled to create more uh, land for the industrialists back in the day. Um, so um, the the site has a wide variety of contaminants. Uh, it's been studied by a number of engineers, uh, as as the mayor had mentioned. Uh, it's regulated by the Ministry of Environment. Um, it would be fantastic news for us as the proponent, uh, if there is less contamination there, it would be absolutely terrible news for the Ottawa River because that's where the contamination has gone. Um, but uh, importantly, from the grant point of view, um, we will only clean up contamination that is present. Uh, and if it's not present, we would not receive any kind of a, a grant from the city for that. So it would make me very pleased if uh, we apply for or, or if we um, qualify for much less than $60 million. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Westlandy, can you give us a little bit of background on the work you've done with First Nations and uh, positioning your organization to uh, engage the First Nations community in employment and other opportunities? Uh, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Mr. Mayor. Um, so this, these, this site is, is literally where Canada's three founding nations physically met. Uh, and uh, everybody here knows there continues to be a very strong Francophone presence in our region, a very strong Anglophone presence in the region. Um, however, uh, the Algonquins, whose traditional territory we're on, uh, do not have as strong a presence as either of those other cultures. So we've gone well out of our way to engage with the Algonquins. Uh, I actually spent the day yesterday up with the Algonquins of Pequotnagon, which you per Kirby White. Duck and, uh, and his council. Uh, we had a feast with the community to celebrate the signing of our collaborative benefits agreement with the community. Um, we've also signed a collaborative benefits agreement with the Algonquins of Ontario. Uh, they represent uh, uh, that are the they have an agreement in principle um, that whose tree lands cover our lands as well as all the other lands all of eastern Ontario. Um, and then we have great economic links uh, with the uh, community of Kitigan Zibi. Um, many of our suppliers uh, come from Kitigan Zibi. In fact. One of the things we're the proudest of is when we started remediation on the Quebec side last year, 80% uh, of our work crew was Algonquin uh, that, that physically cleaned up that land. And that, uh, that was something that I know is very important to, uh, to our Algonquin partners. That's great. Thank you. Uh, anything else from the councillors? Okay. Our next speaker is Lindsay Lambert, uh, who is uh, here to speak on this issue. So you'll have five minutes, Mr. Lambert. Okay, thank you. The uh, uh, one thing which I, like you all have my written submission or should by now. The uh, uh, the one, th uh, one thing I mentioned as just a final note, which I think deserves to be mentioned right up front, is this application is specifically for 3 and 4 Booth Street. Uh, I, I've, uh, uh, I was, uh, did some research into this one because I was curious as to what the, what's encompassed in these two street addresses, and uh, I found the answer in the uh, Region 03 ass uh, assessment rule for property taxes. Like, you're, you're all... Yeah, you're all finance, and you'll know that this has to be accurate because people uh, are charged accordingly. Well, three booth is the is the area uh, with the uh, uh, with the striped uh, striped lines to, uh, just uh, to the east of Booth Street. Four booth is that area uh, of the striped lines to the west of Booth Street. There's also six booth, and six booth, according to the uh, 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 according to the uh, uh, property tax registry, is, a, is three hydraulic lots adjacent to and south of three booth, also on uh, uh, on Chaudière Island. Like Albert Island isn't included there in this, and three and four booth uh, are uh, represent about half of Chaudière Island. So Albert Island isn't included. Like Windmill right now is identifying Albert Island as six booth. But I'm, uh, I'm inclined to accept the uh, property tax registry. Like I produced a little map showing the locations, which coincide with that. And there are two years of notes 
from the property tax or from the property tax assessment rolls. The current one, there is no change. OK. The another point is, is who like who's responsible for paying for the remediation of the of this land? This comes out of land ownership and jurisdiction. And from the legal history, it's it's the federal government. They have the sole responsibility. And I have the proof for that one. The it's I've been doing looking at the legal history. The the province of the government of Canada back when Canada was was upper and lower Canada. This is on August 25th, 1854. Reserve the Chaudiere Islands for public purposes. And you might be interested to know that along with that, the reserve lot 39 on the Ottawa shoreline, which is on the Breton Flats. But there's that. The British North America Act, Section 108, specifies that the land set apart for public purposes and 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 rivers of land set apart for general public purposes and rivers and lake improvements become the property of the new government of Canada. I don't have a copy of that because I'd have to print out the whole BNA Act. But but it's easy to find online. This is further reinforced in an act respecting certain works on the Ottawa River. This was ascended to an 1870 still in force. It establishes that Parliament has exclusive authority over everything in or on the Ottawa River, like irrespective of whether it is for the purpose of public utility or not, or built by the government or private interests. And it is it is all. What's the direct quote? It is all to be shall be held to be works for the general advantage of Canada. And remember, the 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 islands were were federal government at that time. And now the key was this is this is federal government responsibility. One minute. And the and the other thing I have is that is is about the contaminated sites on the islands. Like I have like when they'll produce the phase one environmental site assessment. It contains 20 pages of analyses done by Indian and Northern Affairs in 1980 and 81. And the like it has all the GPS locations, all the all the findings are consistent. And this material came from the Federal Registry of Contaminated Sites. I corresponded with the Indigenous and Northern Affairs. I have a reply from the assistant deputy minister saying I would like to confirm that there are no contaminated sites on the islands. The Federal Registry of Contaminated Sites that you note in your letter is an error on this point. So that's something. The National Capital Commission and the Treasury Board of Canada designated the Chaudiere Islands as national interest landmass. If you could wrap up, you're over your time. National interest landmass in 1988. I've obtained the documentation. And the and it has for the hydraulic lots on Chaudiere Islands under environmental. It says there are no environmental concerns with this site. Thank you. Thank you. Well, over your time now. Does anyone have any questions? Just just one more thing. No, no, no. No one's following the same rules. So your five minutes are up. I'm sorry. And do I have any questions for Mr. Lambert? Sorry. No, I said I said that here's no, no. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Lambert. OK, our next guest is Peter Stockdale. Mr. Lambert. Mr. Lambert, thank you very much. But you have to follow the rules like everyone else. You know, you're not more special than any other guest that has come and spoken for five minutes. We have another guest out of respect for his time. We'd ask that you leave the table. And thank you. So Peter Stockdale from the Fairley Community Association is our next guest. And Mr. Stockdale, you have five minutes. Welcome. You can keep the previous property piece up just for reference. Thank you for 
listening. And uh, you've received my email regarding the 2014 ESA study. Um, I want you to consider the uh, wisdom of, of emptying your coffers with six, of $60 million in an election year when you're celebrating finding $6 million. It makes sense for you to be support, have been supporting an infant industry like Windmill, a quality developer, um, but things have changed. So Windmill is not in control of this anymore. It's dream, 80% 20 split now. It's not a 50-50 thing. So things are not the same. Dream has assets of $15 billion. It's not the same as Windmill. Building is already well underway in Hull. Demolition is underway on Shodier Island, and they're coming to you now. So it seems to me a little bit after the fact un unnecessary. What was the basis of their decision to, uh, that is the staff's decision to, to go ahead with this? It was a review, a literature review of an NCC study from 2006 when the NCC was going to take possession of the Domtar patents of what is, still is, federal leasehold land. We've mentioned, heard mention of the four pits from 2014, which were contaminated but are now clean. Where were the pits? The pits the only the four pits were on Albert Island, where two-thirds of the land, which you can see, is unpatented federal land. There's nothing, and then the address is already be, uh, of Albert um, is already been uh, mentioned by Mr. Lambert. It's been incorrectly identified in the first place. So Albert Island's not even part of it, and this is the basis of your decision. The rest is just a literature review from the past NCC study. It's all leasehold federal, and it appears logically in a registry of contaminated federal land. So why are we paying for it? Looking at what's been actually removed, the ESA assumes removal of the surface fill. But that's not what's happening. It's not going down to bedrock, bedrock throughout on the Gatineau side or on Shodier Island now. They're only going subsurface in the area on Shodier Island where there's parking going to be. So what are we paying for? Finally, surely the project would still be obliged to follow the 7% social housing component. They've made the commitment whether the city is paid $60 million or not. And it's unfair to put them as hostages, essentially, on whether we pay $60 million. Finally, uh, just to add, regarding the contact with uh, the Algonquin, I note that the agreement, the agreement in principle, was actually voted down by Pequotnagon First Nation. So where are we there? Thank you for your time. Any questions for Mr. Stockdale? Great, thank you. Uh, Councillor Chenoshenko, you had uh, comments? Thank you very much. Um, when I look at this um, whole issue in front of us, I think it's important to step back and remind ourselves why we have the Brownfields Remediation Program in the first place. And I see there's two fundamental, fundamental reasons for it. Um, one is we would like contaminated sites to get cleaned up. Uh, somebody has to do it. Unfortunately, with a lot of historical sites, um, the somebody has long ago left um, maybe an insolvent company, maybe someone that doesn't exist anymore, or uh, maybe a government, an organization that just doesn't have the will or the money or the desire to make it a priority to do so. And so we get land that sits fallow, and that's a, um, uh, a euphemism, I suppose, for staying contaminated and undealt with. It's not any less contaminated, or as uh, Mr. West 90 said, if any of that contamination has migrated off-site, um, that's not a good thing either. It getting less contaminated doesn't mean it just went away. Uh, 
it migrated off-site. Um, so cleanup is one. The other very fundamental one is that we as a city don't want to encourage um, development on greenfield sites when there are alternatives. Um, that is, we heard the comment about cost of servicing to new sites, uh, whether they be in an urban environment or a suburban or rural one. Um, greenfield sites, certainly in my mind, uh, should be kept uh, wherever they can be, natural or for agriculture or other reasons. So we are in trying to encourage uh, brownfields redevelopment and this is a policy that uh, facilitates that uh, it offers an incentive to the developer to do the work uh, in exchange for in broad strokes uh, a deferral uh, of, of costs uh, and ultimately the city will recoup in spades uh, in the future um, that investment let's call it an investment from the city so I don't see this as some of our correspondents and letters to editors have said this is some sort of, sort of corporate welfare program that we're handing out money uh, to a company to do work. Uh, and in that sense, it's not really relevant to me whether a company has got $10 billion in assets or $1 million in assets. If they're doing the work and they're following the same rules and they qualify for the same percentage, um, then everybody's playing by the same rules. Uh, I look at the Greenfield, uh, sorry, the Greystone uh, Village uh, development within the heart of my award, uh, would that work have got done? Would we see the sort of urban um, intensification, uh, and I say that in a good way, uh, that is occurring uh, if we didn't have this program? That was a very significant uh, uh, contaminated site. Um, and if we were to look at who contaminated the site and should we hold them to it, well, um, this is an odd one to say. It was mostly f oblate fathers in their robes um, with pails full of uh, ashes from burning coal going out and throwing them on their gardens because that was thought to be a good thing to do at the time. Um, we now know differently. But are we going to hold them responsible for the cleanup? I don't think so. Uh, but through this mechanism, somebody is, and the work is going to be done. So really, that's what matters to me, the, the amount. It's a big figure. It's a staggeringly large figure, which cause, causes people uh, um, some concern. But uh, it has come to based on an estimate of the cleanup site, uh, and ultimately it will be a percentage that anyone else would, uh, would, be, would be paying anyway. Um, so there's no, and finally, there's no benefit to a developer in making up uh, contamination that doesn't exist. Uh, they are going to have to demonstrate that the work was done, uh, or in paying money that they would, would have been able to avoid otherwise. Um, so I've heard a number of concerns, a number of critiques of this. Um, ultimately, I don't think they stand the test. Uh, I will be supporting this uh, application for the exact same reasons. I've supported a couple of sites in the Glebe along Bank Street, where there was a service station or others, uh, and supported the uh, the Greystone uh, the Greystone Village. Thank you. Well said. Uh, other comments on the report? Carried. Uh, we'll go to the library now. I apologize. I know uh, our chief librarian and the chair of the library board have been uh, waiting for us. Uh, just that uh, Councillor Deans uh, had to leave, so the issue uh, that she was going to hold, she's going to deal with at Council uh, for uh, capital budget adjustments. Can we pass that? Uh, I think she had a question about the autonomous vehicle track, $300,000. Yeah. Carried. Carried? Okay. So, uh, okay. Uh, I think it was, uh, yeah, you might, we'll get her in touch with Mr. Willis to get clarification. So uh, this is um, a very exciting city building project, as uh, we all know, and I want to take a moment to uh, uh, commend uh, Chair Tierney on two things. First of all, uh, congratulations, re-elected as Ontario Chair for FCM, which is great news for us. It's great to have your, your voice around that table. And secondly, uh, this has been a... Um, a long time coming and we're uh, seeing the beginning of the uh, start uh, that uh, Councillor Harder really started uh, the ball rolling uh, many years ago and Councillor Tierney is going to see it over the finish line and uh, we had a very good uh, public library board meeting yesterday and uh, today we have the uh, staff report and I, I think is Danielle McDonald here as well? 
So she's there if we have any questions. And we have the presentation uh, first, uh, comments by Councillor Tierney, and then the presentation. So, Count Chair Tierney, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of FEDCO. Uh, first of all, yes, you're quite correct. I do want to acknowledge our CEO and, and, and our great staff at the OPL are in the gallery, as well as uh, representatives from Library and Archives Canada, as well as Trustee Fisher. So uh, thank you for coming here today. First of all, uh, I'm very pleased to report that the Ottawa Public Library Board voted to approve the Central Library Report, receiving the implementation plan, approve the partnership with Library and Archives Canada, and the disposal of the Metcalf Street property. It was an important milestone for the Ottawa Public Library. The Board made one tweak in its recommendations saying it wants to see project information updates on a regular basis, something that our General Manager Steve Willis readily agreed to. There was approximately 90 minutes of consideration, a series of questions from all the trustees. It's fair to summarize that the board is wanting a robust public input. That public ideas are, lead to the design and the function of the new central library and it will be heard to create this great new national landmark. Uh, you quite correctly pointed out, Mr. Mayor, this has been uh, a passion for several years, whether it was even back from Rick Shirelli to Jan Harder, even Bob Shirelli. I think a lot of us all wanted this new central library and it's finally coming to fruition. But it couldn't have been done without the patience and the pragmatic thinking of our board. They spent quite a bit of time thinking about how we get to this point. And we can see we received $73 million from the great work. Uh, thank you for the help, Mr. Mayor, on, on bringing two great bodies together to create an even better library system. So on that note, I'll turn the floor over to Steve Willis. Just, uh, I, I neglected to mention there's a technical amendment, Councillor El Shantiri. I think if we put that up, uh, we can just introduce that now so it's on the floor. Councillor El Shantiri, please. Uh, yes, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Is, uh, uh, the Article 11 uh, uh, in your folder, it doesn't show the last column on the right, so therefore, uh, therefore, be it resolved that Table 3 be amended to add the column titled Parking Facility Cost slash Revenue as indicated below Table 3, estimated up from the requirement. So the last column of in your report is not shown. So. so that was just left off. Okay, Mr. Willis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm sharing this presentation today with Mr. Alan Gontier, who's the Director of Infrastructure Services, and as Chair Tierney has already acknowledged, we have Daniel McDonald, who's the CEO of the Ottawa Public Library, subject matter experts in the audience from several city departments, and our guests from Library and Archives Canada uh, here today. Before I begin, I want to acknowledge that the excitement is certainly growing for the new Ottawa Public Library and Archives Canada joint facility. This is public infrastructure that cities of our size are building as an essential part of their cultural, educational, social, and economic offerings. La nouvelle bibliothèque représente à la fois un service important dans notre communauté et un partenariat novateur entre la ville d'Ottawa et le gouvernement du Canada. Ce projet sera la prochaine étape de la réutilisation du district de zone de l'escarpement et des plaines à le Breton. Bien que le prochain processus de conception suscite un intérêt considérable, nous sommes ici aujourd'hui pour présenter la série d'approbations requises pour ce projet se réaliser. We are asking you to approve a number of critical authorities to enable us to move the project forward to the next steps of what is admittedly a complex partnership arrangement. We have over a 100-page agreement, partnership agreement with the three parties, Ottawa, City of Ottawa, Ottawa, Ottawa Public Library and Library Archives Canada, and 40 sub-agreements with this, and this will help us manage that complexity. We know the community is anxious to get the process going and provide input on the design. The opportunity for that will happen, but first we need FEDCO's approval of a number of authorities to get the project going, and that's before you today. So on the next slide, Mr. Mayor, I'm just going to quickly summarize the five authorities we actually require. FEDCO to approve today. Uh, the first is the terms of partnership with, with between the three parties. Second is the implementation plan, including procurement. Third is the potential participation in a federal district energy program. Fourth is the budget authority and funding strategy. And fifth is underground parking facility recommendations. And Mr. Gontier will continue the presentation, uh, and then I will uh, wrap up with more information on the parking facility and public consultations. Merci, Mr. Willis. 
In terms of the governance structure, this project is subject to a complex three-party agreement between the city, Ottawa Public Library, and Library and Archives Canada. And as Mr. Wallace indicated, this complex agreement is subject to 40 sub-agreements. And these all speak to how the project is going to be managed, responsibilities through design and construction, and also once the facility is operational. Un élément clé de l'entente est la création d'un comité directeur exécutif composé du directeur général, M. Wallace, composé aussi de la directrice de la Bibliothèque publique d'Ottawa, ainsi que le bibliothécaire et l'archiviste de la Bibliothèque et Archives Canada. To deliver this complex project, we are requesting additional delegated authority, and the Executive Steering Committee will have oversight and decision-making on all of these and other key decisions. The Executive Steering Committee will operate on a consensus-based decision-making process, and there are dispute resolution processes in place in the event these are required. In terms of the delegated authority that we are seeking, experience has shown that when dealing with federal partners, there are additional layers of approval, and our respective organizations are subject to different budget cycles. So we are requesting additional delegated authority that will allow us to reduce delay risks as the project moves forward. For example, we are seeking approval for authority to proceed with both the design and later on with the construction, similar to the approach that we used for the Ottawa Art Gallery. We are also seeking delegated authority for the decision to participate or not in the Federal District Energy Program based on a business case to be developed, given that this is an integral part of the design process. The Executive Steering Committee will have the oversight on all of these key decisions. This is not to say that this is the end for Council. Council will continue to have an active participation when we go through the extensive public engagement process, and we will also be back to Council providing regular updates as the project proceeds. So as Council previously approved in 2017, the City is proceeding using a traditional design-bid-build procurement process where the design team will be selected for the design and the project will go to tender for construction upon completion of the design. The procurement process is being overseen by a Fairness Commissioner. Now, we recently communicated that the request for proposal has been issued to the five design teams that have been shortlisted. The intent is to have the design teams in place by the end of this year. The design process, including an extensive public engagement plan, will begin in 2019. Upon completion of the design, the project will go to tender for construction, and we're anticipating construction to start in 2021 and the facility to be operational and open to the public in 2024. This recognizes that we're not just building a building, but also there's time that's required for Ottawa Public Library and Libraries and Archives Canada to fit up the building to function basically for their operational needs. L'objectif est d'avoir une équipe de conception en place d'ici la fin de l'année. Le processus de conception y compris un vaste plan d'engagement du public. Ceci débutera en 2019. Une fois la conception terminée, le projet fera l'objet d'un appel d'offres pour la construction et on anticipe que la construction débutera en 2021 et la nouvelle bibliothèque sera ouverte en 2024. Now, given the location of the site, there are ongoing discussions with Public Services and Procurement Canada on the city's potential participation in the federal heating and cooling services for this joint facility. Because this decision is integral to the design, we're seeking delegated authority for the decision based on the outcome of a business case that will include a cost-benefit analysis and also a summary of the environmental benefits. As I indicated before, the Executive Steering Committee will recommend a decision based on the outcome of that business case. From a cost perspective, since the 2017 approvals, staff have had the opportunity to refine the cost estimate. We believe that this estimate will deliver on Council's vision of a modern, iconic, world-class central library facility. 
the increase of 6.8 million since the 2017 estimate is being shared between the city and Librarian Archives Canada. The additional cost accounts for increased construction prices due to the delay in the project start. It also includes a refinement of the facility operational requirements and it accounts for the relocation of the cellular infrastructure for the LRT tunnel that will help to protect the integrity of the design. So of the total project cost of nearly 175 million, uh, the city share is 104.2 million. Funding for the city share includes uh, a million from the library reserve as was approved by the Ottawa Public Library Board at their meeting yesterday. 3.2 million is coming from development charges. Uh, 20 million is coming from the disposal of assets in, in terms of the existing main library. Uh, and this was also assigned uh, to the city by the uh, library board yesterday. So the remaining 80 million is to be funded through debt financing, which is consistent with the city's fiscal framework for legacy type projects and is less than the 95 million uh, that had been identified as part of the 2017 report. Now staff will certainly continue to uh, explore opportunities for other funding sources to reduce the debt levels on the city, uh, be it through uh, funding from other levels of government or proceeds if uh, Ottawa Public Library decides to proceed with a fundraising campaign and more information is going to be coming forward uh, to the Public Library Board in the fall of this year. As outlined in the 2017 report, uh, there will also be a 1.8 million operating pressure and this will be addressed by the um, Ottawa Public Library through their annual budget process as the facility gets closer to implementation. The existing building at 191 Laurier and 120 Metcalf are jointly owned by the city and uh, OPL. Uh, and at their meeting yesterday, the Ottawa Public Library Board assigned to the city the, proceed, the proceeds of the disposal of the current assets. The 20 million sale of the properties from Slate Properties represents fair market value and it provides added flexibility to the library uh, since they can remain in their current space and the, until the new facility is operational. La vente de la propriété à Slate d'une valeur de 20 millions représente la juste valeur marchande et le et elle offre une plus grande souplesse dans la mesure où la bibliothèque publique peut demeurer dans son espace actuel jusqu'à ce que la nouvelle bibliothèque soit en opération. So in this new facility, our estimates are that we will have 4,800 visitors per day. And this site, as you well know, is well located within a, an area that will be redeveloping over the next 20 years. This is only one site among many as we had to cross the Escarpment District into Le Breton Flats that are redeveloping. And it is at the nexus of a number of important transportation modes. Uh, the council has invested uh, a substantial amount in the uh, development of the Confederation Line, which provides a higher order public transit service than we have today. Uh, to the site, and it's you know, we're within 400 meters walking distance of the the uh, station, and we probably can even make that a shorter distance with discussions with the NCC on a, a shorter multi-use pathway. We are at the nexus of most major uh, cycling routes on the west side of downtown in this location, and we are going to accommodate uh, what we expect to be a very high demand for cycling access to the site with 120 bicycle parking spaces, which is three times what's currently required under the zoning bylaw. We did a careful look at the uh, parking demand and it is a balancing act it's a very it's we have to find a calibration between uh, you know we expect people to travel by different modes and we want to make that possible and facilitate that and encourage that in a downtown situation uh, we want the parking garage to be affordable to the project and what we landed on our, our consultant recommended a range of parking uh, spaces between 200 and 300 spaces roughly thereabouts and we picked the lower end of that because that could be accommodated on one level of parking. Uh, should we had gone, decided to go higher, we would have to excavate a whole new level of, of parking garage, which would drive up our costs considerably. So we felt that this was within the range recommended by the consultant. It certainly valorized the other uses of, of uh, transportation modes, as we are encouraging in the Bayview Station Community Design Plan and the downtown. But uh, we are trying to find that equilibrium with affordability. And just in comparison, this building has an 850 uh, per, uh, spot parking garage. Should give you a sense of size. So this is this will be one level below grade uh, for the, the garage. And then because the site is built on a slope, part of that is actually exposed at grade. So it's economical to build that way. Next slide. 
So our Class C construction estimate for the construction of the parking garage is $18.1 million. That will be financed by $3.7 million from the, the small amounts in pockets in the cash in lieu of parking reserves. Uh, $14.5 million will be debt financed. But the, the parking operations at, at, a, at the 200-spot garage uh, will be cost-neutral in time because the revenues will pay for the construction of the, of the parking garage, and the payback durations will depend on the parking rate that will actually be set, which will be set by council closer to the actual uh, completion date of the project. So we, but we do anticipate, based on our modeling now, that that payback is between 15 and 20 years, depending on the parking rate. So public engagement is a really important part of this process, and the library board last night spent much of its discussion talking about this as well. And our RFP uh, that we put a requirement in more than we would typically put for an architectural a project for the city. We actually have a, a high rated component for public engagement and we do expect iterative public engagement on, on the building uh, throughout the process. Things like the scale and massing of the building, the, the uh, look and feel of the public spaces in the interior, the landscape elements, the amenities at ground level, how it relates to the surrounding sites. And as, as the library board mentioned last night, um, there may be some really good public suggestions on how to innovate and how spaces are actually used. I think we want to see those opportunities. So during the design phase, once we have a, an architect under contract, they will begin the process of public engagement through their rounds of design. And then, uh, but once the, the project is completed and under construction, we will move to a public information mode where we will provide regular updates on the uh, construction progress of the project as we typically do. We want to take the 5,000 people who participated in the previous process leading to this, the, the process where we had developed the, the program, and make sure they're well informed and they'll be on a mailing list and as new people express an interest they'll can, we'll grow that mailing list over time as well. So in terms of the next steps of the project, uh, should committee approve our recommendations today, it goes to the June 13th council meeting. Uh, the planning committee will hear the development applications for the rezoning on the 26th of June and then we'll come to the subsequent uh, council meeting before summer. And then the uh, Government of Canada will be issuing its uh, final projects and spending authorities in the fall of this year and this will allow us to proceed to the next stages. Thank you Mr. Mayor and we welcome any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, on the central heating uh, issue, maybe uh, Councillor Tierney might want to uh, approach Minister uh, McKenna because uh, she's indicated in the past that there may be funding opportunities for uh, greening buildings and, um, and the like. So it might be something to follow up as a, a new source of revenue to help uh, with that particular project. So I leave that as a... Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And actually, uh, yes, I'll take note of that. Uh, we also did discuss the Green Municipal Fund. Since this is looking at being a lead gold building, uh, there's many opportunities through the FCM channel to get money as well. Great. So questions? Councillor Engli, Councillor Wilkinson, Councillor Engli. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a quick question about the parking garage. You've indicated on the slide that the uh, it will pay for itself basically um, through the uh, parking fees. Um, one of the complaints that we often hear is with, with public buildings like hospitals that the parking costs makes it unaffordable to actually take your car to the hospital. Um, so I'm just wondering what, what your model is based on in terms of what sort of dollars are you intending to charge people to park. We want people to go, obviously, to the library. We want it to be accessible in, in every way. So do, have we looked at a range of what we might be charging people to park? Scott Caldwell to answer that question. He's part of our parking operations team. Mr. Mayor, um, the parking program has a mandate of um, promoting and ensuring short-term parking that's affordable in support of businesses and institutions such as this one. Um, as a general practice, we, uh, we look at the comparable rates and try to be at or below those rates. And so we have an idea of what they are now. Obviously, we're looking six years in the future, um, so we will ensure that uh, we're not uh, pricing the visitors out of, the, out of their parking. And will, uh, will this lot be available to staff as well, or is this just for public parking? This parking garage does not provide staff parking. Okay. Thank you. 
Right. Thank you. Councillor Wilkinson, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I spoke a lot about this last night at the library board, but some of the things are in this committee's jurisdiction, which is why I'm here today. Uh, one of the ones I raised, and I still think this is important, was this is like when we did the, the Invest Auto building, at, at, um, you were very involved with it along the way. And this whole process takes the political um, completely out of it. And I thought the chair of the library board should, in fact, be on those committees, or at least an ex officio, that they could go occasionally to them. And this is something I think we need to keep that continuity together. And I put it out as a suggestion. I didn't get anywhere last night, but that's really in your report. Uh, that's the, uh, the, that's the, the, the question on governance. Um, the other I think, uh, Councillor, um, I believe um, there was some concurrence. That if you look at recommendation uh, 2B, uh, it says updates to members of council, and I think the direction that Councillor Tierney and you would like would be and to the OLP board. We add that in? No, that, we're going to get that. I'm not worrying about getting regular updates. Right. I'm saying that the, 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 the reason they're setting up this process is they can make quick decisions along the way, and that would be between getting presentations. And if the chair of the library board was involved in that, then at least you get that input coming into them, uh, because they're not on any of the, the actual committee, governance committees that are actually going to run this whole project. No, I, I recognize that, but I think what Councillor Tierney suggested at the beginning of his comments uh, is that the staff have agreed to keep the chair of the board informed uh, all along the way, and that was a direction to yeah, staff. Yeah, but informed is after decisions, not before. That's all. No, no, but it, but I, I don't think they're going to make a major decision without coming back and speaking to the chair of the board or myself as mayor or whoever is mayor. Well, as long as that happens, it's okay. I just think that's an important yeah, component of yeah, it. Yeah, oh, um, good point. The other one was, I, I do have a question about the procurement system. I was just in Halifax. I had a long discussion with the person who managed the construction of the building. I was fortunate to be able to do that. And the chief librarian, and uh, not only the construction, but also ongoing. They did not use this system to build it. They used what is called the... Uh, construction management system, which is a little bit of a, it's this system enhanced a bit, in that you don't do just one contract for everything at the beginning when you start to build. You actually have it phased in contracts, so you can make the changes that always come up in big buildings like this as it goes along and incorporate them, and let, that saves you from doing a lot of change orders. And it's something that we've never used in the city. It's used by most companies that do large projects in the private sector. And I really think we should be looking at that. Whether we can do it in this one or not is another question because we're clearly way along the lines. We are doing it by separating the design component, which is a good point, but that's only one part of it. And it's, it really is a process that is now widely used. This is going partly towards that. And I just wanted to make that a point because I think it, it tends to be able to save a lot of money doing that. It takes a little more work on the, on the management people running it because they have to do more contracts. But the contracts are always with the city and not with the developer. So they, uh, if you have one contract, the subcontractors are hired by the contractor, not the city, whereas in a, in a project management, the city has control over those. They work together, of course. So that's, that's what I would like to see happening more. And I'm not sure if Kath can count out. I'll go through these uh, two or three things, and then they can comment if they want to. Um, yeah, the other way, I spoke a lot last night about the public engagement, because I was concerned with what I read in this report when it said that the, um, there's a functional components have already been established, and that's what public brings into it, and a design where we hold a broad-based consultation on the look and feel of the building in public space. And I didn't think that went far enough. They have promised me that they will that go farther than that, and I think that Mr. Willis did refer to that in his comments, so I'm glad to hear that. But I think we have to be a little careful on these reports. Sometimes you narrow the gap. They told me what happened in, in, Ham, in Halifax was some things came up as they were going along this process that they had never thought about, and they were able to put these in, and they added significant important things to the library as a result of that. And that's why the going, doing this as you go along is so terribly important. So I'm hoping we can get the same thing from the people here. There are a lot of smart people in this city that can bring up really important ideas. We have a lot already. It's a case of building on that. And they have promised me that, so I just want to make sure that in the procurement system that that is actually done, because I'll be one of the ones feeding into it next year anyway. Um, 
And I do like the way that they're working on getting the, the, the logistic energy and things. Like there's some really innovative things coming in here. And what the, the chair attorney is saying about getting the green municipal fund would be very, very helpful. It had on, I talked about fundraising last year because they raised oh, $7 million in, in Halifax for fundraising and the ways we can do it. We're going to get a report on that in the fall, so it's not in the budget now, but I would like to say that I, I'm quite convinced that we can do that to help get the price down as well. Uh, and the other point I raised last night was about the surplus land. This is going to take about 80% of the property. I think that surplus land has to be kept as not eventually sold. It's not planned to right now. I, I'm sure that the parking is going to be insufficient, and maybe we could have some outside at that point. That's what Halifax did. They didn't put it in the building, but they had extra land, and they put it out for a proposal call, and the money they get for that adds two or three million a year that they use for enhancing what happens in the library. So, and it could be used for that or for additional adding to this building in 10 or 15 or 20 years' time rather than having a building get out of date. You might want to do things. So I just would ask that that land be preserved because land you can't get easily afterwards and that is something that is, is I think important to keep a hold of. Those are I had a few other things I talked about then but those are key issues Mr. Chair and I think it's the library board is absolutely dedicated to this project I want to quickly thank Jan Harder for the work she did last term when she really got this underway it would never have happened without her leadership at the time and for Tim for what he's doing and the staff I think they've put together a very comprehensive report that covers a lot of things. It's actually how they implement it that I'm more concerned to making sure that, and they did promise me last night they would be working more in that direction, and I thought you should be aware of it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Councillor Harder. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank uh, Chair Tierney and uh, uh, um, Councillor Wilkinson, uh, members of the board, and certainly the senior management at the Ottawa Public Library for getting us uh, to this place that we are today. It's exciting. It's, I'd, be, I'd be more excited if it was going to open before 2024, but then everybody knows that my time is always, my time expectancies are always faster than anybody else's. Steve Kanellakis would tell you that. Um, as far as the programming goes, I'm pretty sure that um, if we're going along with the way that uh, things normally would be, I would think that that would be, so the additions and that sort of thing would be the purview of the Ottawa Public Library Board um, and the staff would be coming forward. Um, I certainly don't see Mr. Willis or Mr. Gontier, for example, in a position that they're adding um, things of, of, of a nature that would add to the ambiance, et cetera, et cetera, the library. That's more of, they'll, they'll build it and they'll do it well, but they won't be adding that piece. Am I right in, in saying that? Mr. Mayor, uh, Councillor Harder is correct. The, the Ottawa Public Library Board would reserve the right to change the programming. However, the budget is set by council, so the, pro the project must stay within the budget set by council. If that were to change, we'd have to come back to council for further authorities. Right, and I think the way that we manage the concerns that uh, Councillor Wilkinson had with the um, um, status update, etc., is that the Ottawa Public Library must meet ten times a year. I think that's still the rule. Um, and have a briefing and update once we get into the actual start of the build or sooner if needed where every board meeting you would have it as we had today with Mr. Manconi sitting there saying here's the status update. You have a project manager that would be doing the same thing at the Ottawa Public Library Board. I'm comfortable with that. Correct, Councillor Tierney? Chair Tierney? That would be correct, Councillor. And the other thing I wanted just to touch on because you broke, brought it up, um, Councillor Wilkinson, is the fundraising issue. Um, I can tell you that fundraising uh, is not something, <laughs> and, and, and our CEO is uh, smiling at me from, from there, is not anything you take to the bank. This city is going to be under extreme pressure in the next uh, five to ten years to raise uh, over half a billion dollars for the new Civic Trauma Center for Eastern Ontario. It's going to kick the can of all the work that we all do in raising money for institutions and in particular like our hospitals and most of well, many of us around the table are engaged in that with the Queensway Carleton. Be very cognizant of that and I can also say that as hard as we tried when I was the um, chair, um, 
making money at a gala or something, it sounds great and it sounds achievable, we should not be going to the bank on that. However, the relationship that we have with the friends of the Ottawa Public Library, who, who when I was the chair, were raising over $350,000 a year, and I'm sure that's where we'll have consistent um, opportunities to um, embellish what we're going to do. I'm just really happy that uh, we're, uh, we have this before us. I look forward to it coming to planning committee. I want to thank everybody that's been involved uh, from start to finish. I see Paul Hassar sitting back there behind uh, Elaine Condes, who has been there from the very beginning. Elaine, thank you so much for sticking in and not retiring. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Councillor Harder. And to wrap up, Councillor Chair Tierney. Great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Um, again, I just want to thank everybody involved. It's been uh, a few chapters in, but this is the furthest we've ever gone. We're almost at the at the final yard line. So it's been a very exciting process, uh, a lot of passion and energy. And uh, I think at the end of the day, this board made the correct decision. Uh, there was a lot of pressure to say build, 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 and let's go. We could have went on our own, uh, but our board made the smart decision to hold tight get together with our federal partners, uh, with a lot of great work with our finance minister, uh, with Catherine McKenna, the MP. We were able to put together an even bigger and better product at the end of the day. So thank you very much again, and uh, I hope I have all your support. All right, thank you. So on Councillor Elshantiri's uh, technical amendment? Carried. carried. On the report is amended? Carried. carried. Congratulations all. Uh, notice is a motion for consideration at subsequent meetings. Any written inquiries? Uh, other business? None. Adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Carried. Adopté. Merci beaucoup. Meeting adjourned.